Welcome, 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 everybody. Eric Whitaker here. Good morning uh, from Los Angeles. So I guess it's uh, just about noon uh, on the East Coast. It's early afternoon, evening, or late afternoon, evening in Europe. And uh, and um, so happy to have all of you with us here today on this Father's Day. This is Father's Day in America, and I'm celebrating with my my son, with my wife. And um, so happy to be here with all of you today. We've got a beautiful two hours scheduled for um, for this Make Music Day, this International Make Music Day. The first half, what we're going to do is uh, we'll, um, well, I'm going to bring on Laurence, Laurence Savaz, my wife, and she'll warm us up just a little bit. And then we're going to go through <laughs> yes. say our laughing guys and Laurence Savaz, I know. First time ever. Ever. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll bring on Lawrence Servaz and oh, um, no. oh, what's oh, how do you say it? Laurence. It's Laurence. Oh, Laurence Servaz. I like that better. So Lawrence will join us, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, and then uh, then then we'll we'll look through a boy and a girl, and we'll read through it a little bit. I'll, I'll play some parts, but I'll also kind of do a deep dive into why I composed, how I composed it. And that'll take roughly the first hour or so. We'll, we'll kind of do a sing-along at the end of it. Then, in the second half, we're going to bring uh, into the stream, ugh, really, one of my personal heroes, Alex Lackmore, uh, extraordinary music director, Hamilton in the Heights, uh, Dear Evan Hansen, and much, much more, but also just an extraordinary human being. It's going to be great to talk with him and, and talk about his process. So uh, without further ado, uh, if, if you're in a quiet place and, and ready to sing a little bit, May I welcome to the mic, Laurence Servat. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. You, it's the carry you. <laughs> How you pronounce your name? Hello, hello. <laughs> Let's do a little warm up together. So, um, bassist, tenors, alt, me, the sopranos. Oh, I also, I also hear Alex and his cat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you can all join in. We'll start low, we'll start soft, and then we'll go a little higher. Um, you can octavate, that must be an English word, as you wish, according to your voice type. As always, if you've seen the, um, the Virtual Choir 6 warm-ups online, start with doing some neck rolls, start loosening up the shoulders, just, you know, be a singer and do some weird poses during the day, during the morning before you wake up just to to not be too stiff in the body as we say so um always make sure to do that and then uh let's make music together we'll start with humming so you can either do or you could go to uh to an ng position as in the word ring so ng mm. that way you can have a just the more relaxed show. So I will I will alter from humming and there we go. Repeat. just to warm up a little bit 
what I always do in the morning is, is to always, I say always, do I really always do that in the morning? <laughs> when I know that I have the intention of singing later, I do this mm, exercises just when I'm showering, like I did this morning. I showered for the occasion, even washed my hair for y'all. Mm, just these little things. Mm, feels just really good and relaxes everything, you know, not everything. Mm, no jokes. So, yeah, 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 from an E vowel to an A vowel. Um, very simple. We'll also go a little down and a little up. So take it to the octave you need. So the boys will be here, here, here. Ladies here. Here, here, here. Repeat. Here, here, here. Gentlemen, here, you, gentle Mel, gentle Mel, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, here you need a little bit more space for the jaw. Just can't sing it when your jaw is clenched or closed. So that's why I do it. Yaw, just let it drop. Yaw, yaw, yaw. Repeat. Yaw, yaw, yaw. because it doesn't have any sharps or flats. And I'm one of these people when I'm sight reading my piano scores and I'm like, changes from nothing to three flats. It's like, okay, I can handle that. But then a key change happens and my brain can't function. So all the music I write is almost always in C major. <laughs> 
music for dummies. Okay, a few last things. Boy and a girl is all about pushing and and pulling. Am I right? Am I right? Pushing and pulling. That's me. That those are my words, not not my husband's words. But the but there's this this uh, you know this push and also vibrato. Wife. So I'm just going vibrato because it's early in the morning. But for seeing the piece, there's yeah, yeah, yeah. you lean in it and then you let go a little bit. So yeah. in the beginning, there's maybe no vibrato and then there could be some, but um, ways to maybe practice this could be, yeah. I'll do a little higher for me. <clears throat> So these are just ways to practice the vibrato. Just think of stretching, you know, and when you do an exercise, just um, skills. You just stretch it and go back rather than putting all the the vibrato on it so just think when you're singing boy and a girl it's always it's it's the ocean right or the sea um so just the waves so i guess don't come in too hard <laughs> that was it laurent's out laurent's out so my name it's a french name i'm from belgium it's laurence if you want to do it the french way and the right way my family says Laurence because we are from up north and we speak Flemish, but we also speak French. So <laughs> uh, for the Germans, Laurence, and for the Bavarians, Laurence. For the English ones, not Lawrence. <laughs> Goodbye. Perfect, baby. Thank you. That's Kathy. Laurence Sevaz, everyone. Oh, yeah. yeah, baby. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Good. Um, hopefully you're all warmed up there. Uh, Nick, I'm, I'm speaking to Nick, who is... Uh, Producer Nick, who is producing this behind the scenes. Nick, I'm not seeing the, the chat box, which I would love to see. Let me see if you have sent me. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just open this so that I've got it. Um, let me Perfect, see. Yep. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Pop out chat. There it is. I got it. Okay, I can see everybody. There we go. Hey, everyone. Um, let's see. All right, we're back here. So um yeah now also if you can just turn down Alex's audio Uh, in our, um, oh, I can mute it, I guess. Let's try that. Okay, there we go. Um, good, good. Uh, my, my audio is distorted, went out now, everybody's saying. Sorry, everybody. We're just trying to figure this one out here. Um, Nick, am I back in with the audio? Does all that sound good? Good. Okay. Everybody's saying the, the, the comments are all saying that my audio is not good, but maybe it just got fixed. Maybe because I went on the stream. It's fixed. There we go. Hey, good. So sorry, everybody. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, I'm seeing all these comments here. Um, and it's beautiful to see people from all over. I, I mentioned America and, uh, and Europe, of course, but I'm seeing Indonesia here. I'm seeing Australia, Japan. That is super, super cool. So gang also, um, don't put them up now, but be thinking for questions that you might want to ask Alex later on, Alex Lackmore, uh, when we bring him in. I'll, I'll definitely try to get to some of those questions. For now, let's sing A Little Boy and a Girl, shall we? Um, all right. So looking at the score here. Uh, boy, where to begin? <clears throat> so uh, A Boy and a Girl, um, this was back in the year 1991 i had just begun composing music i'd written my very first piece called go lovely rose and a teacher at the university of nevada las vegas where i was studying um gave me a book of poetry by the mexican poet octavio paz 
And I'm not sure I've ever been as knocked out by a book of poetry on a single reading as I have by Octavio Paz. Maybe E.E. E. Cummings, but I don't think so. I think I remember reading this poetry and thinking, this is the most beautiful, sensual, delicate, human poetry I've ever read. And I remember even on that first reading, I, I bought a book at Barnes and Nobles, and then I just dog-eared every page that I thought would make a great choral piece, something, a music piece of music that I could eventually set. And in there, I, I dog-eared a poem called Water Night, um, poetry that eventually became Cloudburst, I dog-eared. Um, I dog-eared a poem that eventually became Little Birds. And I also dog, uh, dog-eared this poem, A Boy and a Girl. And I tried setting it that year, and it was just a wipeout. It was a disaster. I, I just couldn't. I think I was trying to overwrite it, actually, just trying to be too clever with the words. I, I don't know. I just couldn't find it. And I tried again in 1998 to set it, and it, it also didn't, didn't go well. And then in 2002, uh, I had the poem sitting on my desk for years and years, just waiting to be set. And I, I remember looking at it, and finally it came to me. What I'm always looking for is is what I call the golden brick. So the golden brick for me is, it's this essential idea in the music that, um, that, that contains all of the DNA for the entire piece that I'm about to, to compose. Sometimes it's just a chord, like with Cloudburst. Somehow in that chord is the sound of wonder and awe, and then also, all the notes that are necessary to create the rest of the piece. So it's something like that, or maybe a few notes, but it's also a meta idea, something that's bigger than music. And the idea came to me twofold. The first is that at the, the last stanza of the piece, um, stretched out underground, a boy and a girl, saying nothing, never kissing, giving silence for silence. That it was it was in reading that line that I realized, okay, silence. That's that's the building block right there. Silence. So as we go through the piece, you'll see that there's just there's all of these moments of of silence that are built into the piece. And they're there for very specific reasons. And I, I tried to to notate as long as I wanted each of the silences to happen. For me, that silence has electricity and is actually in a way more music than the music that's happening. In fact, when I conduct it, I always conduct the silences with rubato. So even if we sing that first line stretched out, then I hear the silence with a push and a pull in it, even the, the music, more than the music has. The second was this very simple gesture. So if we just play the bass, tenor, soprano part at the beginning, stretched, it's pretty simple listening to it now, I'm thinking I must have been inspired by Thomas Newman a little bit. I remember somehow that Rene Clausen had played a piece for me that had maybe done this, some version of that, and I loved it. And so that got integrated as well. But basically, if you just play those three parts, it's like this. Now, anyone who's heard me speak about it uh, knows that my favorite part by far is the altos. I just always give my favorite lines to the altos. Um, any of you who are involved in Sing Gently, I went on and on and on about the altos. And A Boy and a Girl is is a, the perfect expression of that. So here's bass, tenor, soprano. But then the altos are always on the second of the chord. So they've got... Which I find just a haunting, strange melody in its own right. But when you add it with the sopranos... and the way they always move together. I love that. And the reason I love that is because, not because I wrote it, this is in no way like, woohoo, I'm, I'm a genius. I love it because it works on lots of levels. That it, it works first sonically, I just love the sound world that it creates. It, it makes me think of the, the gentle, delicate melancholy of the poem. But more than that, what it's doing is it paints this picture of a boy, the altos, and a girl, the sopranos. And then what they do from the very beginning of the piece is they hold hands and move together.
right? You hear them moving through the, through the world together like this. And in fact, through the entire piece, they're always, they're always moving and dancing like this. And, and it's only at the very end of the piece when at the never kissing part that the altos actually go up for a moment above the sopranos. They do this little, this, this beautiful little dance. And even in death, when we're humming, they're still together. Um, and their final chord, still together. For me, this is the ultimate expression of the golden brick. This idea that is musical and unifying, but also has this deeper poetic message embedded in the notes themselves. I don't think for a moment that the audience hears this kind of thing. It's not like they sit in in sit and listen to a once and say, "Ah ha, I hear, I hear the boy and the girl." All of this, but what they do hear is is this deeper emotional message that's being conveyed. I don't know how it works. I just know that it works. So let's take a look at the very first part here. And what I want to do is I want to uh, jump down to the bottom because this also has to do with the construction. So this is measure four where we sing a boy. Right? And then... Okay, so a couple of things here. First, you might find it funny to know that the original, this was originally written in Spanish, the poem, and I read the English translation and loved it, and that's what I said. But the original English translation, instead of saying a boy and a girl savoring their oranges, said um, a boy and a girl sucking their oranges. And that's how I said it. This was originally commissioned by the California Allstate High School uh, Honor Choir. And so that's how they sang the first performance of it. And my dear friend, um, uh, 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 Anton Armstrong, uh, at St. Olaf University, Anton, um, I remember sending this to him and he, by the way, has conducted this piece many times and given some of my all time favorite performances of it. Um, he wrote me back and said, perhaps you'd consider losing the word sucking that <laughs> he said, basically there are going to be very a few high school students on earth who are going to be able to sing this with a straight face. And I think if you're going to lose the atmosphere that you've worked so hard to, to build here. And he suggested, how about you use instead the word savoring, which is, is one of the great edits of all time. So thank you, uh, Anton, for coming up with that. So this part though, a boy. Okay. So I remember thinking that I, if you've ever seen a Japanese calligrapher, somebody who writes calligraphy in Jap in, uh, as, in, as part of the Japanese art form, they'll often sit in front of the, 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 um, the parchment and they've, they've got their brush, their ink, and they wait and they wait and they wait. And then when they're ready, and that's it. The entire the artwork, the creation of the artwork really can take just a few seconds or, or less than a minute. But of course the, the, preparation for the artwork is years and years and years of, of study, of building the skill of meditation, and just waiting for that perfect moment. And that's all you have. And when I read this poem, it felt that way to me, it felt like a like a Japanese parchment. And so I knew that for a boy, and a girl, that I wanted to somehow illustrate their personalities in the in the, the most elegant possible way. And by elegant, I mean, with the, the fewest musical gestures to deliver as much emotional information with as few notes as possible. So a boy, in my mind, what I saw the boy as his character was that he was painfully shy, uh, that, that he had a heart three times too big, but just couldn't, couldn't say a word out loud. And so he just gets, a boy. And it's not that it's sad. It's just shy and very delicate. And then the girl is the complete opposite. The girl is, well, this is very much, if any of you have seen um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, this is very much Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet, where Jim Carrey is just this, this shy, delicate man. And then Kate Winslet is just, she's just an explosion of color and light. She's got orange hair. So even here, um, uh, that that she just that she explodes off the page and then savoring so the idea that we paint the 
character of the boy and the girl with just these few notes, but that we know who they are. So that if, if you ever sing this again, uh, live with your choirs, think about that moment. Think about that, that what you want to do each time with the boy, even in the end when, when we find them in death, that the boy is, is delicate and gentle and that the girl is, is wild and vibrant. Good. Let's, let's just uh, start at the top here, shall we? So, Sopranos, let's go through your part. Ready? Two, three, sing. Stretched. One, two. One, two, three. Yeah, let's let's do just that much. Beautiful. Basses and tenors, let's take you alone. And altos, we're going to save you for for the end. Basses and tenors, let's do you, do you together because you just move in fifths the entire time. Ready? Here we go. Three, sing. So the other thing to remember, basses and tenors, um, if if any of you are in in music theory in high school or in university, or for all the composers out there listening as well, and one of the very first things they'll tell you is no open or no parallel fifths. You can't write par parallel fifths. <laughs> I cannot disagree with that more. I have no idea. I mean, what they should say is, if you want to write music that sounds like it was written before 1750, no parallel fifths. Even Bach has them, by the way, every now and then. But okay, fine. But in the 20th century, the entire rock genre wouldn't would wouldn't exist without parallel fifths, and this piece certainly wouldn't exist. So now, altos. To me, you've got the most fun part by far. Everybody else is forgive me. Other parts, you're kind of white rice, and altos, you're the curry. All right, you ready? Here we go. Three, go. Nice, nice. So then the, the idea here too, even basses and tenors, what I try to do is give each part what they think is the melody. So they think they've got the tune. And it's, even if you hear the, the soprano line alone, it doesn't really sound like a melody. So the idea is that everybody kind of has their version of a melody. And I love that. Um, any of you who know the song Africa by Toto, that I, I love that, that in Africa you hear, um, uh, I saw the rains down in Africa. Then there's nothing that a hundred men or more could ever do. Whatever the, who knows what the actual melody is. All you get is these huge block chords. And it's in those block chords, I think, that, that then it causes this ache in your voice. You're like, I, I don't know which part to sing. Where's the melody? Where's the, and for me, a, all of a boy and a girl is that way. Um, Good. So, so going on and looking at the at the next little bit. Let, let's sing right on oranges, yeah. Just right on the next page. So, sopranos, let's do you. Ready? Oranges. Oranges. Mm. Super simple, right? Good. Let's do again basses and tenors together on oranges. Ready? Three, go. One, two, three, and. <laughs> 
man, I love the sound of all those parallel fifths together. I, I should also tell you, um, this, this morning, um, I was looking through the music and I realized I probably haven't looked at the actual sheet music in 15 years. You know, I, I conduct all my pieces from memory. I have the, the great, uh, that's, that's not a flex by the way. It's just that I wrote them. Um, so I know how they go. And, uh, and also I, I've, I've realized in, in the past, I've got this funny thing, which is that if I'm ever conducting one of my pieces and I forget what's next, all I have to do is think, well, what would I want to hear? <laughs> and then it, then it's there. It happens. It's, it's, it's the great advantage of having written the piece and conducting it. It's not that way for any, any one else, but looking at the sheet music, I'd really forgotten how many parallel fists there are. It's that's basically what the basses and tenors are doing the whole time. Um, Good. So, uh, Altos, let's take you on oranges, yeah? So we'll sing right there. Ready? Three, go. Right? Just super simple like that. Um, also, did we skip? I think we savoring there. Oranges, yeah. We'll, we'll come back and get that. Um, then let's look at exchanging foam. So now we get we get a full major chord, which is actually going to set us up for later on. There's a reason for this, but ready? Exchanging foam. So we sing. And this kind of little modal movement, if you will, to get us back to here. First, it's it's an echo of this, right? It's um, uh, it's the same the the same gesture basically in in terms of harmony. Um, but what we're doing is we're establishing now very, very firmly at the end of this phrase, this B natural, which will, which will be super important at the very end of the piece. I'll, I'll point that out. Good. So then going on, we start just as we began. So stretched. And also something to point out here, see the, the crescendo and the decrescendo. So the idea is that, that we're painting the idea of stretching. Right? We can't do this on the piano, but stretched out. That we're actually going to use the dynamics to paint the concept of stretching. However, this time, the first time we do this uh, in measures one and two, there's that, that nice rest, right? But here we sing stretched, uh, then just one. And altos and sopranos take off, right? We've got that. I like that so much. The way that sounds with the in that four part harmony with the with the sopranos and altos. But what I really want to point out here is sopranos and altos. When you sing, you're stretched out here. So stretched. Uh, the most important part is that breath on beat one on fifteen. So the idea is we're about to leap into the ocean, right? So three, four. Stress. You need a full low tank of air so that you're you can take that long leap first, just so you can sing the notes in that that long beautiful phrase. But more, it's it's the uh, my favorite thing to do as a composer when I'm communicating with the audience like this is to establish a pattern and then subvert the pattern to to say here's the pattern. Oh, it's a little bit different. Just these little sparkles. Ultimately, I think it's a, a beautiful way of teaching. I think people learn uh, in a, in a much deeper way when when there's a pattern established and then changed a little bit and so this is one of those moments where we've established this pattern and then that breath it's like saying no 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 you have no idea wait wait wait, wait. here we go okay so then tenors and and basses so you've got this this um here and then uh yeah and then it comes up I just want to point out one thing. This is for the composers out there. So this is a voicing that I go to often, which is if you take a look at, at the downbeat of six of 17, bass, baritone, tenor. There's something about that, that voicing where you've got a fifth and then a sixth above that, the, the tenors on the third. I use that a lot. And just if you're writing for voice, especially consider that because it gives such a full 
warm foundation for the stuff that's going on over the top of it. So for instance, in 17, you can voice it that way. And then what you can do because you voiced it that way is you can, then you can get away with this because the, the tonality is so coherent. It's definitely C major. There's just no question. And then you can really play with it because you understand the movement and also it really helps the higher voices tune when they're doing those close harmonies like that. If they've got this very strong foundation underneath them, then, then it, it really helps the, the tuning sparkle and shimmer. Okay, so then going on, a boy, ready? So let's just look at this for a moment. Sopranos, you split, altos, nice simple split, uh, tenors. This is also one of my favorite things to do so that both tenor parts are leaping, but leaping to different places. Then basses, you just open here. However, this is already starting to set something up, so. So we still have our, our beautiful, sweet, delicate, shy boy. And altos, you definitely have the money note here, right? If we hear, if we hear all of this without first altos, um, we get, and then it's that third that really makes it shimmer. It's also so disappointing to do this on a piano. It only, this stuff only really happens with a choir, which we'll, we'll do all of that with a, with a recording of a choir here coming up in a few minutes. But also for those of you who are, are real choir nerds like me, this gesture, a boy, I'm quoting directly a piece that I'd written a few years earlier called When David Heard. It's even in the same key. When David heard that Absalom was slain, he went up into his chamber over the gate and wept. So for me, this is already kind of, it's not that it's faded, although I suppose mortality is faded for all of us, but it's that even now we establish in this part of his life, in the middle part of their life, in the salad years, if you will, when they're having children and building a family, that even they're written into his, his future, into his destiny, is this moment of, of kind of melancholy and sorrow that is, that is our humanity, that, that one day he will die. And he knows this. I think he's shy and thoughtful and he thinks about this kind of thing a lot. And then of course, <laughs> then we get the, the, the girl who, uh, who doesn't think about this at all. For her, it's every moment is here, it's now. Even in response to the boy, a boy very thoughtful, shy, the girl, whoosh. To me, it's a great couple. These two would do really well together. I think they would balance each other uh, well. Um, I'm just going to pick and choose the the little bits here that that we um that that we actually work out for the notes just to make sure that we have enough time with with Alex. Um, let's go on savoring. Ready? So savoring altos. And then Yeah, this is this is definitely the toughest part and sopranos if you've got this at home and you can plunk out the parts, just decide, are you second soprano or first soprano? Seconds. So you've got your own little haunting melody there, but it's first sopranos. And this also is the kind of thing that I try to do when I was saying before, where, where it feels then like every part has their own melody. That my dream is that 20 years later, after people have sung this and they're kind of humming along to it in their mind, that's what they remember as the melody, is whatever their inner voice was. Altos, you've got... Mm, it's nice. It sounds French to me. Um, okay, tenors, ready? On savoring and... And right up. Good, and then basses and baritones, again, you're just in fifths, right? So save, uh, then. Super simple, right? And then the whole thing adds up to something uh, a little bigger, hopefully. So then moving forward, um, 
let's say like clouds. So then we've got here. Right. And to me, this is right around the time that I'd written both Luke's Arumque and a piece called Equus. And this was just a chord change that I was entranced by. I, I find this very French impressionistic. I'm sure I must have taken it from either Debussy or Ravel. And to me, this paints clouds, nuage. It's it's just sounds like clouds. And also it's an echo of um, like waves exchanging foam in terms of the gesture. Then we get back to our little, our exchanging foam, this kind of, um, Yeah, I, I guess it's, it's for me, it's one of the things that I, I love to do or try to do is, is if I'm going to be changing keys like this to kind of be, be dancing through keys where you don't really feel the, the key change happening, right? So we're here like way. And then this sounds like just a natural extension, I think, of the key we were just in. And then because this is the gesture, we takes us to here. Then we use that same note to get us back to where we were at the beginning, only this time minor, right? So for composers out there, maybe consider that too. It's a way of, of um, taking the, the hard lines of, of key modulation and just smoothing them out, again, like an impressionistic painting. Let's sing here now. So sopranos, you've got on stretch, two, three, stretched. Good. Basses and tenors, let's look at your stretched out, yeah? Because again, it's just all in fifths. Ready? And go. One, two, Like I remember, so even now at this this quiet moment, stretched out underground, a boy and a girl, even in death, this girl just is sparkling, just just uh, she's shimmering, um, and the boy still, even in death, retains his character, just so thoughtful and and sweet. Um, in my experience, for choir directors out there that are listening, this this moment from exchanging foam, and then we go stretch. That's a tough moment for a choir. And, and it's great to be able to, to practice this kind of thing and this transition. It's especially tough, I find, for the for the altos, right? They're here. And so they've got to be the second of that. And then they've got to be the second of this and then that chord. If it were me, I would rehearse this over and over, this idea of this. So that, uh, so from here to here, to hear. Once you get those three things into the body, then the rest of this thing just unfolds. Then we get to say nothing. Okay, so. Um, and then here. So there's so much to unpack here in terms of the composition. If you'll just indulge me for a moment while I, while I geek out. Um, I'm often asked what is my, what's the favorite, my favorite piece that I've ever written. And the truth is I don't have any favorites. Uh, I love them all like one would love children, which is to say that you love them equally, but differently. You know, each, each child, you just have a different relationship with. Um, that being said, this moment here, saying nothing, never kissing from the end of measure th 33 to the end of measure 37 is probably the truest thing I've ever written and probably ever will write. Um, and I don't say this with any sense of pride, truly. This is only that I feel like I had set up what the piece was. I found the golden brick. 
I truly quieted myself and just did what the poem said to do. And when I got to this moment saying nothing, it, it, really composing has never felt more inevitable than this moment. There was simply no other way that this could go. I haven't experienced that very many times where everything was set up, everything was here, it all had the construction was in place and then it just unfolded. And like I was taking dictation, like, oh, that's the only thing it can do here. Um, and so every time I get to this moment when I get to conduct it live with the choir, I just, um, I have such peace. I really have such, um, such, such, such a sense of quiet in myself. Um, and again, I credit Octavio Paz completely with this because the poem is perfect. The poem has all the music already inside of it. And I really feel like my job was just like taking an oil painting that already existed and dusting it off. But a couple things that I want to point out here. So saying nothing, we keep our same, our, our same uh, motive here where the, the boy and the girl are moving in close harmony, hand in hand. But the, the basses and tenors get out of the way. You see that in 34? Say, so that we move to the middle C alone, setting up then the tenors. Now, remember we talked about that B natural before where when we sing, that B natural is everything. It's the key to the whole piece. And so really what the soprano line is, it just hands it to the tenors. So it's, it should be completely seamless, say nothing. Nah. The tenor should think of that as, as just a completion of the, of the soprano's line. And then when we get never kissing, you won't be able to hear this on the piano, but this is one of my favorite effects ever. And I really feel like I stumbled onto it. So you see when we do at the, um, there, so never kissing. Then we've got here, we land on, this is in 36. So we've got sopranos altos, basses, tenors. And what happens is the sopranos and altos stay on this dissonance, but the basses and tenors move. Hear it? Now you can't really hear it here, but what it does it, when, you're, when you're singing with voices is because the, the tonality on the bottom changes, it changes the perception of the melody. So what it sounds like to the audience's ear is you hear, but really it's, and it's like this ghost melody that's created only by the movement underneath. And it just that effect I find so sweet and ethereal. And then we, we get to the end of this. Um, uh, let's see, so there, um, and then here. So now we set up the suspension. Where does that wanna go? It wants to go, to that B, right? But not yet. So then we again quote when David heard. Again, that suspension wants to go here. Not yet. You just get a little passing tone. Then all the silence, right? And then, only then. Still that suspension. We want that to resolve, right? To here, but not yet. And we go back to the beginning now with the humming because there are no more words. Our, our, our two beautiful uh, uh, heroes of the story, they're gone. They're underground, sleeping, eternal rest. And we just hear the echo of their life, right? And then finally, there's that B here, but still not resolved. And now 30 seconds later, you get the resolution. And again, I don't think for a moment that the audience is listening to this and thinking, ah, um, uh, there it is. There's finally the B. But what you, I think what the audience feels is settled. They're just in that moment. They, they know there's that breath that can be let go. That, by the way, for composers who are interested in it, and I'll do another talk about this sometime, it's called background counterpoint. Bach does this all the time. The idea that you might leave a note hanging and then go on and do a whole bunch of stuff. But that note, many bars later or many pages later, 
will finally resolve itself. So you've got this other piece that's being played out in in uh, like pointillism uh, through throughout the piece. And that's how a boy and a girl was constructed. So, okay, now that we've gone through it, I know that wasn't the best rehearsal, especially if you've never heard this before. <laughs> um, um, a boy and a girl is, is uh, it's definitely level two in terms of sight reading, but but we've got a super special treat this morning. So Voches 8 recently recorded A Boy and a Girl, and it's easily one of my favorite recordings ever of this piece. It's just stunning what they did to it. They've also, it's the slowest version I've ever heard of, of the piece recorded. They just take time and savor every chord and every word. And what I thought we could do is instead of me playing through the piece and you singing it, how about we play the video of Voches 8 uh, all the way through. If you've got your sheet music in front of you, you can either follow or you can sing along with them. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge honor to have them have recorded this piece and to have recorded it so beautifully. So everybody ready? Okay, grab your music. Here's going to be your first notes. Bass, tenor, alto, soprano. And Nick, whenever you're ready, let's let's do the Voches 8 video.
<laughs> Isn't that amazing? Oh, Bocious 8, it's, uh, it's just exquisite, exquisite work they do. I should also say as a composer, it's, um, it's profoundly humbling to, um, to have a piece of music that you wrote performed with such, um, with such depth. Uh, it's, it's, I teared up a couple of times, um, actually. You can tell they truly, truly understand the poetry, the music, every part of it. It's, um, and then they bring something else to it that I never could have imagined. So it's just, it's just, I'm humbled, endlessly humbled. All right, so that's it for Voce's eight. So gang, now here comes, <laughs> here comes uh, the, the, the part of these, this two hour session that personally I've been waiting for, for I can't tell you how long. Uh, Alex is waiting just off screen, uh, screen, but, uh, if, if, uh, if he'll indulge me, I just want to tell a quick story about the first time that I met Alex. So we had a mutual friend and I had scored tickets somehow, some way to the last uh, performance, the last couple weeks of the original cast of Hamilton. And if any of you out there are Hamilton fans like me, um, you know what that means. S seeing that, that, that cast, the original cast, the, everybody who's on the album, um, the, the few weeks before everyone, before everyone stepped down in on Broadway. And I took my son to see it. Um, so it was just my son and I, and we're, we're watching this and Alex and I had a mutual friend and she was kind enough to connect us. And I said that I was coming and Alex couldn't have been more gracious. And he said, tell me what seats you're in and, uh, I'll come and say hi afterwards. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so our seats were kind of on the aisle and, the show finishes, and for any of you who have seen it live, I don't know what your experience was, but the album is bad enough. I mean, every time I listen to the album, I end up crying. I mean, really crying. But live, uh, Philippa Sue that night, I don't know if she did this every night, but the last note noise she made, she kind of, ah, she gave this little sigh. I, I still get chills thinking about it. And my son and I burst into tears, and everybody's standing ovation, you know, people screaming. And, and then suddenly I feel this hand on my shoulder. I look over and it's Alex or Eric, it's Alex. <laughs> so Alex had just run around, uh, or I think, were you music directing on that? I'm sure you were. So you just finished the show and had come running around. Anyway, suddenly you're there in my face and I'm just a mess, an actual mess, Alex. And you said, hey, do you, do you and your son want to come backstage? <laughs> I said, oh, you're kidding me, right? And so he took us back and we met, very briefly we met Lynn, we met a bunch of the cast. And then he took my son and I down to the pit and my son's a bass player. And so he sat and played the bass and actually played the drums a little bit. And it's, it's one of the great nights ever of my life, seeing that show, meeting Alex, just being overwhelmed by the unbelievably artistry. And then when I look back on it now, it's probably the best dad moment I'll ever have. And Alex was part of both of these moments that somehow I was able to take my kid who was into music, who's into Hamilton, and have him meet Alex and the cast and be backstage and stand on stage. It was it was a glorious, glorious night. So without further ado, please uh, welcome to the stream. I mean, really one of my personal heroes, Mr. Alex Lackamore. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Eric. How are you, buddy? Hey, man. Thank you for the kind words, man. And yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you got to see the show, especially as you reminded me, it was that last week before the, the original cast started to... Uh, leave uh, a little by little but yeah you, you came at, at a really exciting time for us because we were gearing up for making the film that's about to come out and yeah it was just uh i remember there being an electric feeling in, in the in the theater around that time so i'm glad you got to see us uh oh, the ogs <laughs> yeah, it was so special and it was um I, I think you're right i think actually not the night that we were doing it but there were there was cameras everywhere oh and my so god I think, I think they must have been basically filming what will be released it's july 3rd right that the film yeah will... the film comes out july 3rd and we filmed it on two days uh, we did a, a sunday matinee and a tuesday night and we filmed the performance in front of a live audience oh, so it wasn't God. like you would buy tickets and say oh i'm going to attend the live filming of hamilton it's just people who happen to be in the theater that night were attending a broadway show that just happened to have like seven nine cameras whatever all around the theater recording a performance that was going to be eventually released. And we also had a Monday where we did some pickup shots as well, we, where we got to do some steady cam stuff. And yeah, it's, it's really thrilling. I'm just glad that that Jeffrey and, and Lynn and Tommy all had the, the foresight to capture that moment in time before, before it went away. Yeah. I mean, it must've been kind of, I, I, we can just dive in right here. Like it's just Hamilton is this once 
I wouldn't even, I wouldn't, don't even know if I'd say generation. It's a once in a 50 year phenomenon. It feels like a once in a lifetime thing for me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it, it, like how does it, does something like that ever happen again? And so it must've been, uh, I, I can't imagine what it's like to be part of the, of the snowball, right? Like for instance, like you're saying that, that you're going to film the thing knowing that, oh, we need to film this because this, that's why I got tickets. Mm. I, I, I moved heaven and earth to get those tickets because I knew this is, this is the Woodstock of my generation. <laughs> See this. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. But what was that like for you from, from the very beginning all the way up? It's interesting, Eric, because I never, I'm not one of these people that uh, while I'm in something, I think to myself, oh, this is going to be the biggest thing ever. This is going to be, I, I try to have like kind of no expectations in that way. And I, I often tell a funny story when we were in rehearsal for, um, the show, uh, we were rehearsing in around November, December before we had had uh, any performances off Broadway. And no one had seen the show yet. It had never been performed in, in front of a paying audience. And I remember saying to Tommy, our director, during rehearsal, I'm like, Tommy, this is the proudest I've been of anything I've worked on. I think this is the best work that Lynn has ever done. I think this show is going to be uh, uh, really special. But are people really going to come buy tickets to see a show about hip hop told through American history, or, 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 or so about American history told through hip hop? I didn't think uh, it was going to uh, catch on in that way. So I was proven very wrong by Tommy and Lynn and everybody. But uh, yeah, I you know uh, all I know is that while you're in it, you're just trying to make the best piece of art possible, right? Like all we cared about is um, making the thing good. And what Lynn was presenting to us was so phenomenal. And what he was giving us was gold, really. I mean, it, it's a dream as an arranger or music director to work on material that speaks to you in that way, because everything he was doing just really lit me up. And um, we all just tried to do justice to what he was giving. You know, it was all our goal to, to not mess it up. It was all our goal to really uh, give, give everything we had to see that thing through and take care of Lynn's baby. And we all felt that we all knew it was special. And because of that, everybody on the team was giving it their all. And, you know, it's interesting in theater, you're paired with teammates, right? And sometimes maybe you've played other games with these people. Maybe you're meeting them for the first time. Um, so there's always a learning curve, right? There's a little bit of like, okay, let's see how this goes. You know, how, how do we proceed? Um, but fortunately, a lot of us had worked together on In the Heights. So we were already family. So there was a shorthand and we were able to just go and we all were on the same page. And I, I attribute, I credit Tommy Kale for being the amazing coach that kept us all, uh, you know, with our eyes on the same prize. But everybody was just firing on all cylinders, all departments from lighting to the sound department, to costumes, to choreography, everything. It was all, we all just wanted to make it good because we could tell that the piece was special and it really spoke to us. So I'm, I'm really, really um, just proud of what we created. It's um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into Hamilton big time a little bit later, but, but so you, you grew up in Man in Miami, right? Or in, <laughs> Yeah, so I was born in Los Angeles and I lived there till I was nine. And then I moved to Miami and li I lived there from like nine to, to 17 or so, 18. So when, when you think of home, do you think of LA? Do you think of Miami? Think right now I think of Miami as home because my immediate family's there. I still uh -huh. have tons of cousins in, in LA. And when I go back to LA, there's memories that take me right back to being a kid, whether it's the the feeling of the air, whether it's seeing the palm trees or, or just something about the... I, I, I go there and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember being here as a child. I remember forming my earliest memories here. But right now, home is where my family is. My my mom, dad, and my sister, and and they're in Miami. And then, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, go, please. Oh, and then I went to school in Boston at Berkeley College of Music, and then I moved to New York in 1998. So I, I've always lived in pretty big cities, but New York, I've now been here 22 years, so I've, the longest of any city I've lived in. So this now feels like home. In yeah, that way. yeah. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. So Berkeley must have been a great experience. And, Perfect. And yeah. did you know, even at Berkeley, that music theater is what you wanted to do? Or did you even know earlier on? Not at all, dude. I, I, I went to Berkeley thinking I was going to be probably a jazz pianist. I think in my mind at that time, I was thinking, okay, I'll graduate and like pick up the phone and call friends and try to get gigs playing in jazz bands or cocktail parties, whatever it is. Um, but I had always done musical theater growing up. Um, when I was in junior high school and high school, I went to arts junior. I went to an arts junior high school and an arts high school. Yeah. So while I was studying my classical music stuff, I was still kind of like moonlighting, playing with the theater kids, and I loved that because it really gave me a well-rounded uh, education in that way. But I was genuinely interested in theater. Like, for example, once I discovered Pippin, there was like no looking back, and I was like, okay, all of Stephen Schwartz's material. And once I learned about Sondheim, I'm like, okay, all of that. So, um, but still, I was, you know practicing my scales and, and doing my repertoire. And um, 
I, I'm, I credit being in an arts uh, institution for my uh, junior high school and high school years for really just expanding my mind because while in my personal life, I was very much interested in rock and classic rock and stuff like that. I'm still singing in choir. I'm still playing in jazz band. I'm still uh, learning how to play jazz piano. And, and I, I feel like I learned about everything and that really helped me do what I'm doing today. And were you composing at the time? when you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was composing in, in quotes. I mean, I wrote terrible pop songs. I mean, when I, I it's, they're embar embarrassing titles, more embarrassing chord progressions. Um, so I guess I, there was a point in my life where I wanted to be Billy Joel. There was a point in my life where I fancied being on a rock and roll stage. And, and it's like, you know, I, I'm a kid of the MTV generation. So like something about seeing the video for Jump and like seeing the way Eddie Van Halen like looks at the camera and smiles. I'm like, oh my God, I want to be doing that. Like that seemed like the life, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I became a Billy Joe obsessive. Uh, and so, yeah, I think I wanted something like that. And uh, there's a point in my life where I'm like, oh, maybe I can do something like what Paul Schaefer does. You can music direct and have a real cool band and be kind of known for what you do, but all, you know, also not really be in the spotlight. It, it's, um, I, I've never really had a, a, a clear target of what I want to kind of, uh, I could never tell you, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I just knew I wanted to make music. Yeah. So it just so happened that while I was in Boston, getting ready to move to New York, Around that time, I was doing a lot of musical theater because I was playing for vocal lessons at the Boston Conservatory and therefore playing auditions for shows at the Huntington Theater in Boston. And then um, at that time, The Lion King had just opened up on Broadway. Uh, they opened in 1997. And The Lion King on Broadway was holding a nationwide talent search. They were going to individual cities just to like look for local talent for, for their, their records. And they were going to do a week's worth of auditions in Boston. And I was hired as the audition pianist because I was still living there. So for that whole week, I had to sight read songs. I had to uh, play for all the singers that were coming in. And on the last day of auditions, the music director and associate from uh, um, New York flew in to Boston to hear uh, the, the final callbacks, to hear what they had uh, um, uh, kind of um, whittled down to by then. And then when the music director, Joe Church, and, and he brought uh, Cynthia uh, Westfall with him at the time. And I remember um, once he found out that I was moving to New York, he's like, Alex, I hear you're moving to New York. When you get there, you should give us a call. And that was amazing because like, I wasn't gunning for uh, uh, you know, any kind of job in particular. I, I was just kind of trying to make these singers look good. But by being an audition pianist, he saw that I could groove. He saw that I could sight read. He saw that I could transpose on sight. He saw that I could play Stevie Wonder songs off the top of my head with no sheet music at all. Um, and, and then by that, he just saw what I could do. So it was because my, uh, it was through my playing that um, he called on me. And again, I attribute what I learned uh, from my playing through all the stuff that I did prior, like all the jazz band stuff, all the hours spent at home trying to learn how to play cult of personality on a piano. You know, it's like, what business do I have trying to play that, trying to play Led Zeppelin songs on a piano, but I just needed to, that was just the, the my, my, my way of, of um, uh, uh, really getting inside that music. It was really um, important to me to know how to play it. Amazing. You know, I've always thought that it's a very special breed of person who can do what you're, what you were doing it there at the beginning where you're, you're basically playing for auditions, right? Because God knows what comes through the door. And I mean, it in the best way, you know, you don't know what the sure. people are going to be. You don't know what they can ask for. You don't know mm -hmm. how, how nervous they are, what, what, what they need from you. Right. And so I, I think those kind of audition pianists have to be unbelievably empathetic mm -hmm. and adaptable. So in addition to being able to sight read like a monster, in addition to be able to, you know, make music with anybody immediately, this person you've just met, and also to yeah. do this a hundred times a day, right? Yeah. Like, like the ch then, then it's also, it's, it's like instant collaboration. Yes. And if there's one thing I've learned about music theater, it's all about collaboration. And that's right? why I do it. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, to your point, Eric, and, and it's true. I, I know that when I was an audition pianist, all I really cared about is making the song and the performer as good as possible. So, for example, like if the uh, uh, auditioner would, you know, they, they walk in the door nervous sometimes and they try to give me a tempo of a well known song. And when I can see that they're counting the tempo really fast in my mind, I'm like, you, you mean like the original tempo, right? Like, yeah. I'm like, perfect. I got you. Uh, so like I, or they would bring in sheet music for a Stevie Wonder song where I could tell that the chord symbols, sometimes in those uh, vocal selections, the chords aren't always right, <laughs> but I knew what they were. So I would ignore what was written on the page and play the right chord because I wanted the song to sound good. And um, 
and, and I, I, I remember one time I was auditioning, someone came in and sang a jazz standard. I wish, it might've been stormy weather or something like that. And they just brought me a lead sheet. And I just remember like, oh, this is great. I just get to play. So in my mind, I was just like playing a jazz standard with a, a singer who was amazing. So I, I treated like, like a performance in that way. Like all I cared about is making sure that they felt good, that they felt secure and that they had a good foundation so that they could therefore just, just be their best. But like you said, Eric, it's totally collaborative, which is why I love theater because yeah, yeah. we spend so much time practicing by ourselves, right? In isolation. And, and, and I love, by the way, hearing you talk about A Boy and a Girl, which is such a beautiful composition and like hearing you talk about your process, which was so cool. Um, you know, I think about that moment, right? When you've just written it. And I, I thought about you specifically because like after you've like finished putting your pencil down, the moment after that, between when you actually get to hear it, like how much anticipation is that filled with, right? It's like, I can't wait to hear what this sounds like. In my head, it's one right. thing. Yeah. On the piano, it's another, right? But until you hear those voices back, and that's the collaborative part, right? Like all we do, it, it's we need that energy coming back to us. We need that interplay. We need people to commune and, and, and to make music in that way, which is why I'm very excited for the fog to lift from uh, our, our current uh, shutdown so that we can all get back together and, 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 and play again. Yeah, man, this must have been it, it particularly difficult for you because, you know, you and I have met a couple times now mm -hmm. and, and uh, you're just so warm and such a such a, uh -huh. a people person, you know? Thank you. Likewise, dude. Thank well, you. Thank you, man. But I, th I think if you're going through the same thing I am, I'm dying not connecting with people. You know, Zoom is one thing, but just sitting in a room with people and either making uh, music or just having coffee or it's, it, it's like, it's, I, I don't, I think obviously people are, are struggling with this all over the world. It's sure. It's truly difficult. I yeah. No yeah. Yeah. And also just like the, the age that we grew up in, right. Where that human contact was so much a part of a, what we do. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people are now getting used to what that kind of interface is, what that contact is, but yeah, I still long for it. Just the way energy feels when a person walks into a room, right? It's just the way a person like looks at you without saying anything and what they're transmitting through their eyes. You can't always capture that on, on Zoom. And, and, and who knows, like when they're talking, they're looking at you, like maybe they're still like, you know, typing emails on the side or like, you know, <laughs> or frying an egg or who knows? It's like, yeah, there, there's a way that uh, you commune with people when you're right in front of them that I, I do miss and I'm looking forward to getting back. To and, and for something like, like the discipline of musical theater, it's just essential. Yeah, like, oh, of course. So, so, okay. So had you also been arranging in, in school? Were, were you jazz arranging at the time or were you for yeah. your voices? A, a little bit of everything. I, I would say I, uh, uh, my earliest arranging memories is probably just like transcribing, like whether it was like, um, you know, taking a, a song off the radio and trying to figure out how to play it, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> like <laughs> trying to figure out how to get the, the bass to happen in the left hand, you know, how, how to, uh, you know, try to make the, the piano feel like a band. So I think that was my earliest ways of trying to figure out how to make the piano be an instrument. And then uh, um, I would sometimes get jobs transcribing pieces. I remember being in high school and someone needed uh, sheet music for I Know Things Now from Into the Woods. And it was hard to, I don't think either of the vocal selections were out or that song was not in it, I can't remember. But I remember sitting down, like trying to figure out, okay, now I have to figure out how to make this Sondheim transcription look as good as all the Sondheim vocal selections I've seen up until now. So I had to make decisions about what is the melody? What is the voicing going to be? How does it fit under the hand? So piano arranging was probably the first thing I did. And then I also remember being in high school and there was a singer songwriter who was in the art department. His name was Alfredo Galvez and he, uh, was a wonderful artist. He did oil paintings and sculpture, all that stuff. But he also like played a beautiful guitar and sang amazing songs. He wanted to make a uh, uh, an EP or something to uh, to play during one of his art installations. So I took it upon myself to take each one of his songs and try to like build an arrangement around it. Like I would take a four track recorder and play bass on top of it. For one song, I would enlist an oboe player and a clarinet and write some. To some you know dyads for them to play over the music. Uh, and another song, I'm like, oh, there's this beautiful intro at the top with this guitar arpeggio. So I'm gonna write this viola line on top of it as a melody. So I was uh, orchestrating and arranging in that way. I would um, write underscore music for some plays as well and have to orchestrate that for a, a brass band or something. So um, it's always something that, that I wanted to do. And then Berkeley is where I started to really um, um, get the, the nuts and bolts of it. But I have been doing a lot of it on my own. So just kind of a self-taught in that way. It's, it's you, you can tell, I'll be honest, because it's um, you have a facility with it that is that's 
I would call effortless. Oh, least, thank you. Know, you. I'm sure there's a lot of ugly pages. At least they're all <laughs> in my room. So I, I'm assuming you're the way, right? It's it's so nice to present the finished work. Be like, see oh. how easy that was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> totally. There's effortlessness to it, and a uh, like a beautiful logic to the way that you put these things together. Thank you. Thank you. And um, a lot of that I attribute to picking up the electric guitar and the electric bass in high school. I, I attribute that to being interested in drums at a very young age. I wanted to be a drummer first. I was obsessed with drums. So because of that, I feel like I really approach rhythm section writing from an insider perspective. And I really like when I play stuff, I hear what the bass would do. And, and I, I've always had this weird thing where like I could listen to a song and not specifically pay attention to what the drums are doing. But if you turn that song off, I could tell you exactly what the drums are doing. Cause like somehow subconsciously I was aware of what the pattern was and I could pick out what the, what they were doing. So because of that, that allows me to kind of really get deep into the instruments, right? Like I could do alternate tunings on guitars and try to come up with like peculiar voicings. But I really, when I'm writing, I try to really like, you know, if there's a voicing I'm not sure about, I'll sit down and pick up the guitar and play it to make sure it fits. And if it doesn't, I'll rewrite it or I'll find some uh, uh, you know, uh, peculiar way to, to uh, make it happen. But I, I try to be like, okay, what would be the most fun thing to do as a drummer? What would be the most fun thing to play as a bass player? What, if I were playing keyboards, what would I do that would be a, a contribution, but also be integral to the arrangement? And that came from time. And what I mean by that is some of my early rhythm section writing, like when I was doing my old Bat Boy stuff, when I look back at that, I could tell like a lot of my guitar writing was very like, power chords and like, you know, a lot of like meat potatoes, like, you know, caveman stuff. But thankfully, Larry O'Keefe, the writer, was using the guitar so unconventionally and was like doing counter lines and inner lines. I'm like, oh my God, that's how you should be using it. Yeah. And then I started to pay closer attention to bands like Yes, where every single instrument has its own part and it all fits together. And because of that, the band sounds huge, right? There's five dudes in that band and yet it's like a wall of sound. And I love that because everything works together, but individually each part is, is special. The same thing with Rush, right? It's like they are phenomenal. Yeah. And like, again, that, that's another band that like I can go down in on the weeds because I, I made it a point, like if I was obsessed about a Rush song, I tell you, I would know how to play the drum part on my MIDI keyboard. I would know how to play the bass part and I would know how to play the keyboard part or keyboard part or the guitar part, whatever it was, like the solos, everything, because I needed to know how they did it. And again, back to the obsessive part of the arranging and composing, I would then grab my four track and try to like try record to it all myself. Amazing. Or take my MIDI keyboard and program the drums and 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 play on top of it. But um, yeah, for whatever reason, it was uh, this obsession with me to recreate songs that I loved and learn exactly how they did it. And that's why I, I draw on that stuff to this day. I'm like, oh yeah, this is a, a Getty Lee type of bass bill. I'm like, oh yeah, this is probably a Bonham kind of thing. I'm like, okay, uh, here's Keith Jarrett, everybody. You know, it's like it's all it's all there, and it's it's become part of my DNA because of all the time I spent um, studying it growing up on my own. Yeah, it's the way to, it's just, it's the way to do it. Um, so, okay, so you moved to New York and you start mm -hmm. as, as just a keyboard player in the pit for, for Lion King, right? Uh, I, well, um, more like a keyboard sub originally. Um, the main thing I did when I moved to New York was probably audition piano. And I was playing auditions for um, the show Aida, which was called Elaborate Lives at the time. I was playing auditions for other shows like Man of La Mancha. Um, uh, I eventually got to play for Rent uh, working, uh, at, at, you know, for a regional production. So through all these different shows, I got to meet other music directors yeah, yeah. and composers yeah. who got to know about me. So yeah. through playing auditions for working, that's how I met Steven Schwartz and got on his radar. Right. And through playing for rent, that's how I first met Michael Greif and Tim Weil and, and Bernie Chelsea. So I, I slowly, I, I kind of got to, uh, be known around town as like the groove guy and I'm 23, 24 years old. And I, you know, my calendar is free. Like whatever you need me to do, I, I will do it. And then eventually I, I learned to be an associate for a show. I saw that get put together from the ground up. Uh, I eventually uh, emptied Bat Boy. I eventually uh, uh, got to be an associate on Wicked. Um, so all this to say, um, you know, it wasn't like all of a sudden, boom, I'm, I'm playing in The Lion King, but it did help that Joe Church uh, made me, he called me often, not only to sub in the pit, to also play auditions for all the Lion King auditions, to play rehearsals for the Lion King. I was probably one of maybe three rehearsal pianists at the time. And again, like Jill Church had enough faith in me that he asked me to train other rehearsal pianists for Lion King. 
like again, like I, I think it's so crazy. Eric, but can you imagine if you were like, I don't know, in my age now, 45, and here's this 24-year-old punk like trying to tell me how to play piano. It's like, thank God they didn't like just smack me out of the room. But I, you know, I, I guess there was just something about the way that I play that that he um uh, liked. And um you know, again, I attribute that to all the, the work I did prior, right? Like how to treat the piano like a band, how to like play, not just the piano part, but to play the orchestra. And that is how it's always been my approach. But I'll bet it's everything, man. It's also that you make singers look good. Like you said, it's actually an aesthetic of yours. It's a foundational aesthetic. And so everybody who comes to the room, it, I'm sure singers, first, you also got to meet all the singers in New York. Absolutely, and, yeah. So probably off the top of your head, you'd be like, here are my 10 favorite singers. I, like, so you also knew the town, but, but also, you know, uh, uh, young people, I'm sure you get this a lot too. Young people are always asking, how do I break into the business? And mm. number one for me always is just be lovely to work with. Yes. It, it's yes. such a thing. Right. And so, yes. so, so uh, not only were you doing all of this and your music playing, you know, your musicianship was incredible, but also you, you. Just, you were collaborative, right? So yes. that, that in the room, it's like, yep, get, get Alex in here. He's going to, He's just gonna make it happen. He'll work with us. He can, and that's that's as valuable as any of it. I would. Imagine. I agree. I agree. And that that's when people ask me, it's the same thing. I'm like, oh yeah, practice this and get better at that. Blah 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 blah. And I always end with, and be a good person. <laughs> you know, just like treat people well, be kind. Because again, I, I learned a lot of hard lessons just by opening my mouth at situations when I shouldn't have. And and um, yeah, just learning about protocol, about rank. Uh, staying in your lane, like I, I had to learn that the hard way a lot of times, and I'm glad I did. I'm glad I had people who just kept me in check in that way. And again, I, I, I carry all that stuff with me. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this later, but it's something that that I've always wondered about. That because okay, so with all your experience and that you've got a bit of distance from the shows that you're watching being built from the ground up, you, you know what I mean? In that you're you, you've got just a little distance. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. Do you, do you find yourself sometimes sitting there and watching and saying, I know exactly what the solution is? Oh. Or saying to yourself, it's super obvious to me that the problem is this character, that song needs to go and this needs to be rewritten. And that like, but but like you say, stay in your lane. It's like either they need to figure that out or what's the right way to say that or the right time to say that? Do, do you know what I mean? I, I know exactly what you mean. So um, I will say this, I, that is not my forte to look at another piece of theater, for example, uh, and be like, oh, this is the story part that needs more focus. Uh, someone like Tommy Kale is excellent at that. Uh, Lynn is great at that. Uh, Blank, Andy Blanky Buller is great at that. Uh, but I'm such an easy audience member that I go along for the ride so much that like I tend to like respect everything. Like even if I don't love it, I'm like, yeah, it just wasn't my thing. You know, I will never say, oh, that was terrible. You know, it's very rare that something affects me so viscerally that to the point to say something like really bad about it. I'm like, you know, they just didn't do it because X, Y, Z. Um, but musically speaking, yeah, there are times where um, as an arranger, I'll think to myself, hey, you know, this is how I would do it. This is what, you know, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Because this is a, a big kind of credo of mine. I have learned that as an MV and as an arranger, a lot of the stuff that I write and do, it's just preference. This is just the voicing that I liked, right? This is the chord that I wanted to go to. And sometimes you'll be on the same page with someone and they agree. I'm like, yeah, that's that's my favorite chord too, or that that works for me. But um, a lot of times, you know, who am I to say that, you know, that album is garbage, you know, like cause there's a lot of people who love it. So clearly there's some merit in there, right? There's some value. So there's something to appreciate. So, um, you know, that just was someone else's preference, you know? So I, I might choose chocolate, they might choose vanilla, but neither is wrong. It's just what I prefer. So even when I'm talking about cutoffs in my show, right? Or talking about, yeah, this is the, the the dynamic and the swell I want there to be. Like, you know, there's no end all be all saying that that's what it has to be for all time. That's just what I liked, you know? And if people are on the same page, fantastic, but there could be a whole other rendition. You know, a whole other person could have arranged a, a show of mine in, in their own way and it would be, have been just as beautiful, I think. So yeah, it's all just taste in that way. It's very gracious. <laughs> <laughs> and <true. laughs> yeah, so, I mean, why don't we just jump right into Hamilton? Let's, let's, yeah. okay. So, I mean, I, I started, I was thinking about this the past couple of days, like what we could talk about. And the truth is there are so many parts of your career that just merit hours and hours and hours of, of talk. There's so much that just me as a fan wants to know. Mm. We'll probably have to do this again if you're up for it, where we can just- <laughs> Sure, anytime. Uh, even something like Dear Evan Hansen, which also is just, it's a totally different kind of work, but my God, what, and what, beautiful work you did on it, man. Oh, thank you, man. I love that, that music so much. I love that show. Yeah. yeah, it's it's just gorgeous. So I think Hamilton, 
you know, like we talked, it's just this phenomenon. I remember the first time I heard it and I'd heard it all the way through the two things struck me. One was that I, I made it all the way through and whatever the, how many, is it 30 something tracks on the album? Thirties. Right? <laughs> oh, wait. Oh my God. I think it's 46, 46, 46. Yeah. Which is already double a <laughs> It's but, a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. And, and then I remember thinking back after I'd heard it the first time, I was like, can I think of a single track that didn't have the choir in it? Is there, that's super unusual. And, and the way you use the choir that, you know, that, that, that Lynn and you developed the, the choir, the, the way to use it, it's mind blowing to me because uh. it's generally, you know, in musicals, the choir is there because they're a character. They're mm. the talents people or they're the, you know, the employees in the castle or whatever it is, they've got a function for being on stage. Mm. But, but I remember hearing Hamilton and thinking, actually, this is like a concept album. Mm. And, and I think, at least for me, part of the reason for its success was that the album works completely. If mm. I'd never seen it live, I still just get blown away by the album itself. And it was as if you'd approach the vocal writing specifically, like a concept album, like oh. just studio singers doing all of this stuff. So I don't even know where to start with this. Um, <laughs> well, well, let's do it this way. What, what did you start with? What did you and Lynn start with? Sure. And, and thank you for the kind words, man. Uh, so first thing I'll say is this, um, Lynn's writing tends to really rely on dialogue back and forth or, or communication or ideas flowing back and forth between characters. What I mean by that is it's very hard to find a song by Lin-Manuel that you can perform with just one person. That's hard. Like right now I can think of one, Burn. <laughs> but like you think of uh, Breathe from In the Heights and you need a Pidago guy to sing, andando camino, right? You need Abuela at the end to sing, Nina. Or you think of the opening number and all the characters in that, right? The same thing with Hamilton. You, you think about the back and forth that happens between people. So his writing tends to have a lot of that built into it already where there will be an idea that floats in that um, uh, complements what, what the, uh, the, the main character is thinking about. Um, so it's great that a lot of the... Um, opportunity for backup writing is there. So that that's number one, which is great. Number two, um, yeah, you know, the, the choir stuff for me, um, again, like, you know, yes, being a big influence for me, um, uh, just being in choir is a big influence for me. Uh, there's just something about the back and forth. I just love, I, I've grown to really be fond of backup writing that uh, comments on the story, that interjects and, and fills the spaces. I become fond of backup writing that also has a point of view, meaning that you'll find in a lot of my backup writing, it's not a lot of oohs and ahs, it's actually phrases. It's actually words and thoughts that either are complete individual sentences in and of themselves or finish the thought of what the other person is saying and, and is hyping what the other person does. But like, I, I always, please, please. The reason you were doing that as well was to give, the, so that the people in the choir aren't just props right? Even then they're singing from a point of view, like exactly. they've got a chance to dig into a character. They have a story to tell. Yeah. They've got a story to tell. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Keep going. I didn't mean no, to please. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly right. So um, yeah. I, I, then what becomes of that is if Lynn's demo will have the suggestion of a choir, then it'll be up to me to be like, okay, this is the voicing where I think it could be. I'll, I'll invert it or I'll try to come up with a, a inner lines perhaps. But um, a lot of times Lynn's very clear about where he wants it to be. And a lot of times there'll be no choir stuff written and then I get to do my my thing. Uh, Wait For It is a case in point where Lynn's original demo has very few backups at all. And if there are there, it's probably unison, an octave unison doubling what's there. So that was one where I kind of like just let to get, I got to let my imagination run free because there's a lot of echoes and repeats and a lot of pockets and things that kind of come together. Um, speaking of pockets, are you, what's that? I was just gonna say there's that acapella version online. Of oh. Like that is unbelievable. You're conducting uh, a cast on stage. It's like 360. Oh my God. I, I mean, love that thing so much. Yeah. But to me that, that just, it just shows off your vocal writing so beautifully, man. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. I was going to say about Hawkins. Are you a fan of dirty projectors? Uh, what is dirty projectors? Oh Sorry. my God. The dirty projectors. It's, it's, they're like an indie band. It's a Brooklyn band. Dave Lonsgrith is the, the, the writer. Oh my God. If you don't know about them, please, when this is over, I'm sending you the thing. You're, it's okay, going to blow your mind. Okay. Thanks, okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, okay. So, so then 
Lynn, does, does he present you with, do, do you sit at the piano and he plays through it? Does he send you like a rough uh, vocal track? What does he do? It depends. In the old days, it used to be Lynn sitting at the piano. Um, he, uh, the really earliest uh, Heights song, in the Heights songs were lyric sheets with chord symbols typed above them. And Lynn would sit down at the piano and, and you know, kind of give me like a... Just, you know, like the, the chord progression, sit down and sing along. And because Lynn is a great pianist, he can get around, but, uh, you know, he's self-taught mostly. Yeah. And he can't uh, always play and sing at the same time. Like, you know, it's sometimes you have to stop and think about what he's doing. Uh, but there were many times that he would present the song and he would just get up off the piano and be like, okay, Lack, you play it. So then I would get down and, and then my fingers would come up with certain figures and, and certain montunos and certain phrases. So a lot of that comes from me sitting down and improvising as I go around the framework that he provides. Huh. And um, and then eventually Lynn got to get more and more into GarageBand and eventually Logic. So that's when he started to overdub his voices, right? And create stacks of choirs. And he would start to program drums and come up with bass lines and find the sounds that he fancied. and. Then, you know, eventually he would start giving me fuller blown demos of what he wanted the songs to sound like. And then it would be up to me to discern what that is and, and kind of, you know, figure out how to execute it. Right. Like I would see it as, OK, this is the, the, the framework. So now how do we fine tune it? Right. Like, OK, this is the suggestion of backup writing. How can we actually uh, find voices that get the choir to be in the best parts of the range? Right. And what are the the the, the counter lines that I think can be brought out more? What are the ways to to take a theme and and to um, either contract it, expand it, um, have it, you know, all that kind of stuff, all, all the stuff that an arranger does. So um, I'm thankful that Lynn leaves a lot of room for that. He's uh, open to, to that, and he's not a composer that's sitting, uh, you know, over, looking over my shoulder and, you know, kind of like you know, micromanaging all the decisions. Like he, he, uh, for him, uh, it helps to hear um, the finished product, either if it's a demo for me or if it's, you know, hearing it on band rehearsal for the first time or hearing the choir sing it after I've taught them the vocals. That's when you can weigh in and he'll be like, yep, I like that voicing. Let's lose that there. We don't need this. Let's do that in unison. Da, da, da. And then that's, you know, we, we collaborate back and forth in that way. But, but I love that I when Lynn writes stuff and when he presents demos to me, I clearly see where he's going. There's something about like, I, I and this is from years of practice, right? From being by his side and knowing what he's into and what uh, what makes him tick. Yeah. I now feel like, oh, when I hear something he's presented me, I, I, I know where he's going. Like I know what he's going for. And so, um, yeah, like when I present it to him, he always has the ability to say, yeah, I don't want that there because he's sure. a composer. Yeah. He's the writer, right? I'm I'm just an instrument along the way, but I I do I'm extremely proud of the fact that along the way I get to put my voice into it, right? Oh. As a writer, my choices and as I said earlier, my preferences make it into the writing, and, and in that way, I do feel like there's a way that I hear music that is apparent in in Hamilton, that is apparent in Dear Evan Hansen or, or the shows that I work on, and I um. You know, I, I get so humbled and, and so grateful whenever I have a friend who knows me, when they hear something I've worked on, they say, oh, I hear you in that. Yeah, I, I when I heard Dear Evan Hansen, I swear, I was like, yep, I hear, yeah, whatever it is, your your sensibility, your touch here, it's, it's it absolutely is there, man. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, you very, very much have your own voice. It's, it, it reminds me of the great, like, 70s rock producers, right? Oh, where wow. Where, you, thank you, man. You know what I mean? In the, it's like, oh, you know that sound. It, it oh, doesn't man. really matter what the band is, but you know the sound coming from that producer. Thank um, you, thank you. It, you know, it's funny. I, I this is going to sound totally terrible, name droppy, but um, Trey Anastasia from Fish, yeah, saw Hamilton, super huge Hamilton fan. <laughs> he wrote me an email where he said, "I was watching Dear Evan Hansen, and as I was watching it, I thought to myself, wow, this person is totally ripping off Alex.' And then I looked in the program, and I realized it was you." <laughs> So coming from him, that meant a lot. <laughs> and I was very, very honored. <laughs> That's a, okay, so what the, the cool part is we actually have some stuff here, right? We brought Sassy. Yes. And, yes. And uh, yeah, so for those of you listening right now, uh, I mean, I, it's impossible to pick a favorite from the from the Hamilton soundtrack, but Satisfied is as virtuosic as it gets. I love that track. And also for me, when I listened to it for the first time, that's the, the moment that I was in on the show. Oh, you know, right on. Like, I love it. I love it. I love it. Something that's about satisfied. It's like, oh, wow, this is way smarter than I had imagined. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, it, it, and we're going to dig 
deeper. We're, we're there. There are no low fruits, no low hanging fruits here. We're we're going <laughs> for the for the, high, the highest reach. So, I think what we have here even is we have a SoundCloud uh, track of what Lynn would have basically first presented you with, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So why don't, why don't we just listen to a little bit of that? Is that that's cool? okay? Okay, great. And Alice, why don't you stop? You just stop this whenever you think it's sure. Me. How about we get to like to the first uh, verse or something? Okay. And if you need to stop sooner, let me know. So you can hear the piano figure, right? Yeah. That's that's the figure. That's it the song. To the groove. To the groove. To the groove. To the back. To the, to the, the backups are there. But it's single notes. They're not necessarily triads. You hear that counter line in between, right? The drums drop out. I don't know what you mean. Right. Such a change. I'm never satisfied. Is that right? I've never been satisfied. Drums. Alexander Hamilton. Where's your family from? Unimportant. There's a million things I haven't done. Just you wait. Just you wait. So, so, so. So, this is what. So yeah, so you can hear like, yeah, and it's great to hear where it came from, right? Yeah, it's it's stunning having heard the 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 album version so many times, right? It's uh, uh like uh, first just for, you know from one music maker to another, I'm amazed that you're able to separate like hear that and hear that as a template. Like mm -hmm. it's so hard for me to divorce myself from like okay, let's just set. Do you know what I mean? Even the sound. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That you heard it just as a as the framework for a much bigger idea. Yeah, yeah. And I, I will say this. Uh, eventually, what helped me was whatever kind of boundaries were set by the show. Meaning once I decided, oh, it's going to be a 10-piece band, in a way that helps. Okay, these are the colors that are going to be available. Oh, I have a string quartet. So that's going to make me write in a certain way. Um, and you know, I have two keyboards, and now I have to think about what they're going to do, and and what what's the what is Ableton going to play? You know, knowing that helps you kind of whittle it down in that way. Yeah, but yeah. also decisions about okay, what are the things that I want to feel more organic? What are the things you know? Because there's something about that uh, a demo, um, uh, and this is not an a, 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 a criticism at all. There, there's a little bit of coldness to it, because there's so much space. Right. There's a lot, and there's a lot of the sounds are very synthetic, also. Yeah. So you know, it's very kind of electronic. Um, and, uh, and, and by the way, what's interesting is that um, the story goes that this song, Satisfied, was originally a song that Lynn manuel was writing for Karen Olivo. She was uh, in the process of making a solo album and she wanted Lynn to write a song. And he came up with a theme, he came up with that figure. And that was the song he was writing for her. And then I don't think he ever came up with lyrics. But um, at some point when it came time to write the song Satisfied for Hamilton, he wrote Karen and said, Karen, I need that song back. <laughs> You know, and she's like, no, take it, take it. You know, it's, he hadn't, uh, you know, it finished it for her in that respect, but it spoke to him and he felt like that was the right uh, 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 song for that moment. So um, anyway, all, all this to say, um, yeah, that there is, uh, and, and oh, the last thing I say, what was fun is opening the logic session for this, because when, as it loaded up files, one of the files was called Karen Olivo song. <laughs> and I hadn't seen that in years. And like, it reminded me, yep, that, that's where it came from, y'all. Um, but yeah, anyway, all, all this to say that there, um, I, I'm always looking for ways to to have the the music sound warm when it needs to be, and uh, you know I, I worked on a show, a Broadway show called Bring It On. That was very synthetic in its nature because it was inspired so much by cheerleading music. That's very kind of EDM and techno based, so that has a, a definite kind of like sheen to it. Um, but I wanted uh, Hamilton to just make sure that it still possessed the warmth. So that was an important thing for me about making sure it had piano and harp and get acoustic, get acoustic guitar and et cetera, et cetera. But, yes. Uh, so like, for instance, that that decision, did you, obviously you made it with Lynn, but did you sit down and say, I think more of a pit band, I'd like it to look like this group of instruments? 
So what happened was, yes, um, the good news is, is that with Lin's demos, he was tending to use a lot of uh, strings with the demos. And one day in an early incarnation of the reading, I think uh, it was around the time we were gearing up to uh, do a reading at the O'Neill. Oh, no, not the O'Neill, I'm so sorry, at, the, at Vassar, Vassar in, um, um, at the Bard College, that's where we were, I think. Uh, no, Vassar College, I'm so sorry, everything's blurring together, my apologies. But yeah, it was Vassar, Vassar College. Um, and then um, while we were there, I remember Lynn saying, yeah, I, I want the strings to be to Hamilton what the horns were to In the Heights. Once you said that, I'm like, I got you, I get it. Huh. So that's where I knew a lot of the um, interplay was going to be coming from, where the texture and the sound was going to be coming from. So once you said that, I'm like, great, and I got it. And the best uh, um, uh, seal of approval that I got was when we did a reading, Michael Starobin came to, to see the reading and he's a fantastic orchestrator and arranger and, and pal. And I remember him asking me, he said, Alex, so I'm just curious, what do you, uh, what's the instrumentation you hear for the show? And back then we had only done like an act or two. And I remember, oh, it's gonna be a, a, a pop rhythm section with a string quartet. And it said, that's perfect. That's exactly what I would do. I'm like, woohoo, all right. I'm doing what Michael Sterabin would do. So I felt like I, I was uh, on the right path when I got that. Ah, uh, it's good. And the, I mean, the, the funny thing is you look back in retrospect, it's like, okay, that's what it was and that's what it became. But that decision is so important. So right? important. It changes everything going Absolutely. forward. Absolutely. Yeah, um, and and how many guitars? Like, is it two? Is it one? You know, same thing. Like, Dear Van Hansen has two guitars and one piano, Hans, uh, uh, and Hamilton has two keyboards and one guitar. Because I didn't think I needed two guitars for the sound of that show. I figured one w was enough. So it, it's all about what the score is saying to you, right? Yeah. There's a, a certain energy you're getting from it, and a certain sound you're picturing, and and it has to be catered to every every piece individually. Okay, so so you start with this with this track. You get it from from Lynn. Yes. And then I guess you go into your cave. Was it this cave <laughs> now? Or is it, this is a new place now, right? So this is a, a different cave that you were living in. At the <laughs> this is a different cave. It was on uh, 87th Street. Yeah, okay. No, wait, so 81st, wait, hold on. No, I moved out in 2010. So 81st Street. Yeah. So now, yeah, yeah, exactly. So now I'm up on 92nd. But nice. uh, yeah, and so I go into that cave. And um, the first part of the process is to get the, the demo transcribed. And um, so uh, what I have here, uh, do you want to start to? Yeah, please. Okay, so this is amazing. And I'm so excited that we get to do this because uh, I've never really done this, which is kind of go on a deep dive into the arrangement process. And um, what I have here is I, I have some screenshots of some uh, of the finale files where I have one on top of the other, a transcription of Lynn's original demo. And a uh, underneath that is uh, what is published in the vocal selection. So in other words, it's the final product. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I, first of all, I have to get props to Scott Washerman, who transcribed Lynn's original demo and is a big fan, by the way, and says hello. But by the way, a lot, my, my whole Hamilton music team, they're all fans. They're, they're all so excited yeah. that I'm talking about it. Right? So <laughs> hi, hi to the Department of Treasury, wherever you may be. Um, that's our name. We're the Department of Treasury because there's so many of us. Um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, first things first, um, as you might have heard from Lynn's demo, uh, the original was an E flat minor, um, which is great because then that original figure is all black keys. Yep, that's right. Right? So um, for our purpose today, we, we put it in C minor. So at the very top, so you see where it says Angelica demo, the ensemble demo, and then the rhythm section demo, which is basically a takedown of the part. Yep. And below that, you see Angelica Broadway staff, the ensemble Broadway, and the orchestration Broadway. So this is basically a reduction of what was there. So um, as you can see, the first thing I did, so we're in C minor, I did, this is note for note what Lynn did, right? Note for note. So the first change is for me at bar seven, I, instead of Lynn's voicing, which is up here. So if you see a bar eight, he just has that, was that the major seventh, which is a little kind of harsh, right? So I wanted to just round out that chord a little bit. So my voicing measure eight, just to give it a little bit more context. Yeah. Same thing at bar seven. I just put that voicing down there. So that's that little counterpoint there. That's just a, you know where my hands went. So uh, next page, bar nine. You see here. So in Lynn's version, you see that uh, the counter line. It's down in the left hand. Right. Yeah. But that's there. So for me, I just wanted to dig it out so it was more audible. So if you look at the orchestration version, the up there, just so you can hear it better, right? So it makes it more tender, I find, you know, in this moment. 
What's that? It makes it more tender. Yeah, 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 exactly. And you just hear it better. And then again, if you look at Lynn's version of bar 13, his pattern breaks a little bit. So let's go back. So uh, 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 bar nine, Lynn's line, bah, bah, da, 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 right? Oh, sorry, I, that go back was for me, not for Nick. Sorry, Nick. Okay, you're good, buddy. Thank you. So a uh, bar nine, Lynn. Bah, da, 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 da. So the pattern breaks. Bah, da, 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 so um, the reason I changed that is because for me, that caused a, 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 a clash with the melody that was rubbing my ear from your sister. Twice. There's always by your side. So for me, it, it just, uh, uh, it hit me the same way that I wanted that to be a little more gentle. So what I did on my version of 13, I just kept the, the candle line going, Mister, which clashes this, who is always by your side. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah. So that was just a choice. And again, if at any point Lynn had said, hey, I want that back, it would have gone back. Because there were times, I, I would tell you this a quick little story, and, and it's quite uptown, um, right? The voicing goes to C over E, but that F is, is clashing. And in my first demo for Lynn, I actually changed it. And Lynn's like, no, 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 you got to keep that F. Okay, great, great. And now it seems so perfect and inevitable. But to think that there was a time that I thought to myself, oh, that uh, that should be, that's, that class should not take place at that moment, right? And for you, you don't take any of that personally? Like, no, not at all. Right, Please. Whatever, whatever. No, 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 no. I mean, again, like I said, Lynn is a composer, right? At the end of the day, it's his piece. And I just have to serve the piece and serve the moment. And as I said earlier, it's his preference. And so it, that's what it is. But if there's something I feel strongly about, I'll, I'll push. I'm like, oh, well, maybe it's this. And, and maybe I'll try to find another way, not to present the same idea I had, but maybe that other idea leads to another one. And there's another way that gets me the same kind of result without being the very note that he didn't like either. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's a way to kind of negotiate what that is. But at the end of the day, if he just says, nope, I prefer the original thing better, we go to the original thing. And then right? that's what it is, yeah. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out here is just the, the ensemble writing. So if, again, if you look to Lynn's stuff, so uh, you look at uh, his bar, bar nine, right? To the goom, to the goom, to the goom, to the goom. It's all just unison. To the right, to the right, to the ba da 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 uh, It's all just unison. Yeah. And then he has his counter line, Angelica, 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 and then it cuts off. So that's all there, right? And then we go to the ensemble version of Broadway. First thing I did was I referenced the demo and I realized like Lynn, it's not just to the groom, to the groom, it's more like to the groom, to the groom, to yeah. the groom, to the more spoken. So the first groom is to the groom, it's just one note. And then we add more people, make a dyad to the groom. The ladies come into the room, so we have a triad being yeah. built gradually as more people join in and, and cheer them on, right? Same thing, to the bride, to the bride, and that's on pitch, right? To the bride. So what I did, I took Lynn's line and harmonized it. So the girls are a and tenors bar, yep. and what you have is the baritones are already holding and then, so we have that resolving that way, right? And then again, I, I wanted them to go into the downbeat, bah, right? And again, counter lines, Angelica. Da, ba, da, da. I wanted the line to keep going. Yeah. So, but I just love the idea that, like, you know, in a crowd setting, if someone says to the groom, like people are going to say it all scattered, right? No one's going to say it all at the same time through the groom. It's going to be too perfect. So th this is just a way to kind of like you know, uh, approximate the sound of different voices coming in at different times and we have like a mess of sound happening, but it's organized just enough to yeah, be able to. I mean, but it's beautiful. It's like building drama. It's you're, you're adding yeah. as much to the scene as everything else, right? It's it's really, it's it's just, it, sorry, man. I'm, I'm just thank you. No, oh, please. Thank you. Thank you. Over and over. And thank you. Thank you. I'll give you an Easter egg. Ready? <laughs> look at bar nine for the uh, ensemble on Broadway, right? So if you look at to the groom, the first group of men to say to the groom is Lawrence, Lafayette, Mulligan, Washington, right? Second group, we add more ensemble members, but Burr, because he doesn't like Hamilton as much, is the last guy to say to the groom. Uh, <laughs> and, like no one would ever notice that except for those who are just talking right now. <laughs> but Burr is the first guy to be on board to say to the bride when the guys say it. Oh, that's really so. so oh, yeah. But, but is that something like when, when you were working with, say, with Leslie Odom, did he know? Like, oh, yeah, that's that's consistent with my character maybe i if and if he did maybe he was smart enough to figure it out or maybe i just told him in the moment i yeah, i can't yeah. remember honestly it's really um, nice though thank you buddy thank you um 
So yeah, um, yeah, we can go to the next page. And yeah, it, it's kind of more the same. So again, you see Lynn's figure, it's there, it, it, it's there as well. Da -da -da -da, rewind, ah, great. So this is fun. If you notice in Lynn's uh, demo, bar 24, he doesn't go to the five chord, right? May always, always be satisfied. Or rather, sorry, it is there, but the left hand doesn't go there. And the Broadway version 24, the whole band drops out and that's just backwards effects, which is the figure backwards. And again, it's intentionally put backwards sonically and the whole band drops out so we can hear it backwards as well. So that on the word rewind, we're actually- Exactly, yeah. Rewinding, right? And for instance, when when in the in the album version, when you actually literally rewind the music, right? You hear mm. it played backwards. Was that your decision? Were you like, okay, let's do this. Let's actually- I think it was a, a collaborative. I think, again, hearing the word rewind, you know, all of a sudden you just have ideas. And we kind of did a trick like that in Bring It On where there's a lyric that says, everyone's gonna stand up and say, rewind that. And uh, yeah. the band drops out and we hear them, nip, 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 you know? So yeah. uh, we use that, 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 and Lynn was brilliant to use that. So we just uh, just capitalized on that idea. Cool. Um, so this is kind of fun. If you go to the next uh, page, Nick. So uh, there is this part doesn't exist in the demo because this is the actual rewind sequence where Things at the time starts to go backwards in the show. Yep. And the way this came about, um, we knew we wanted physically to rewind. So Andy Blank and Mueller needed music for that to happen. And I'm pretty sure, like Lynn said, okay, I, I you know, it, it should go. And he sang it. He vocalized it. He went, bom, 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 bom. Okay, great, I got it. So then he would take that and write it and keep going. So then for me, you know, I, I want to change, right? I, I'm an OCD guy, or, or sorry, ADD guy, so I want to move. So then when we get to bar 29, the rhythm changes, and then we just play into the hemiola. Right? And again, this is part of the compose, uh, arranging composing process, and I'm sure you deal with this too, right? There's so many ways that scale could go, right? And for me, it's deciding, is it, uh, no, that should be B natural. No, that ends on an F. Uh, da, 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 da. No, too high. Ba, da, da, ba, da, da. Okay, that one. So, uh, you know, I'll do it like 20 times until I finally find the one that speaks to me that feels the most right. So, it, it, no, it's just what feels right. Like, boom, just what feels right. He hits me in the gut. That's it. Exactly, exactly. And I think what felt right, quote unquote, to this means that it ended on the G. Because da, 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 I just wanted to have that pivot chord handy. Uh, yeah. Right. And then we go to the next page, Nick. And this is Lynn's little bit. Bum, bum, bum. Rewind. Bum. Rewind, right? Yeah. And that's all me, right? Uh, and that was a demo that he came up with. It's like, yeah, I think it should be, I remember that night, I just might, I remember that night, I just might. He just had that idea about a record being scratched and repeating and over, he heard the choir saying, rewind, rewind. So this is all uh, what Lynn uh, had. So this is just basically kind of just transcribing all the magic that he already yeah. had. Um, so we get to the next page, Nick, bar 36. So in Lynn's original demo, the figure kept going. And uh, I, I just uh, regret that knife for the miss, right? right? And it, it was a, a copy and paste. But for me, I wanted more space to that. So what I did was I halved the figure, or, or I quartered the figure, rather. Nothing, nothing. So that way you can really zero in on the vocals, because yeah. all you hear is the vocals. That just clears the space for you to be focused in on her, Yeah. right? And then you hear that little ladies. That's That was Andy Blankenbula's contribution to be able to, uh, uh, that uh, calls back to the moment in Winter's Ball where they say the word ladies, right? Uh, uh, yep, yep. So that's what that is, that's a call back to a prior track. And then, yeah, I just kept going with that idea of just only hear that opening part of the melody, right? And then the left hand is approximating the drum figure, again, which is the way I grew up, right? You try to play drums with your left hand. So the left hand, boom, 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 right? The pinky's playing the kick drum, thumb yeah. is playing snare. <laughs> All right. So it's the, the left hand's beatboxing, basically. Right? Amazing. Right. And then go to the next page, Nick. So then the second time through, then I try to bring in more of Lynn's melody. So if we go to bar 44, ba -ba -da -da -da, and then ba -ba -da -da, so we bring in a little bit more of that idea. Ba -da -da -da. So basically, Lynn's original line starts to come more and more to focus. So we try to start to add more and more pieces to it. Because then that's, you know, it, this is the answer to this question. So there's that interplay happening back and forth. Yeah, the yeah. Of, right? And then uh, da, 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 go to the next page, Nick, bar 51. 
Okay, so if you look at Lynn's demo, set my heart aflame, this is not a flame, this is not a get. So again, the drums just kind of transition you into the next section. But for me, uh, I'm a big fan of what I call the light switch in an accompaniment, which means having it go from really a lot of sound to almost no sound at all. Oh, so for yeah. me, I get more uh, uh, value out of that when what happens just before has a little bit of punctuation to it. So if you look at the uh, orchestra reduction from Broadway, set my heart aflame. Left hand, ah, 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 right? So just have that little hit there, because when that happens, well, ah, ah, you have a little bit, uh, uh, it just kind of cues you into this new section where you can all of a sudden feel this change. Yeah, it's almost and, like a lighting change. Like you said, like the lights, like you can, I would imagine the lighting designer on stage is like, yep, here's what you do. Yeah, it just, it builds up to a, a moment. It builds up to something happening. And it could have been not a game, or uh, it could have gone to a big downbeat. Yeah. But instead we go to the negative space. Because again, it's one of my favorite things to do. Just go, yeah. okay, no bass at all. Just like everything's upper register, which again was suggested by Lynn's demo. Um, uh, let's see. So the beat drops out. He has some timpani there. Oh, and by the way, yes. I think Lynn had told me he, want the, he wanted the choir to harmonize with her. This is not a game. So then it's up to me to figure out, okay, is it not a game? I think he might have sung that. And I'm like, okay, let's harmonize that. So the tenor is getting up. And then soprano, this is not a game, right? Yeah. Right? And again, what I love about that is that even though it's a G7 chord, you got the B flat up there, right? And that to me, that just comes from gospel writing, right? Yeah. Like it's about triads. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the accidentals are. And I'll show you another example of that later on. But, yeah, just um, do just whatever the whatever the triad is, like you said, right? Whatever the triad is, and it, it always sounds fantastic. And then I let me ask it. you real quick, so about that, about that choice about gospel, right? Yes. Which is in some of the songs, but not all of them, but especially this one. So is it, you're just kind of taking from the sense of style or the sense of attitude of, of the character or like why the choice for gospel? Were you taking a, a bit from Lynn's demo? I think it's just kind of what I go to. That's just what felt right to me at that time, that sound. Uh, wow. And, and you know, I, I think for me, whether that's influenced because of the song that's there, because like, you know, I, I, yes, it could be because of the score, but there's tons of gospel writing in, in Dear Van Hansen as well. You know, it's not to yeah. say just because Hamilton's hip hop that that influences that kind of writing. But there's just something about that kind of, of sound, this triad, the simplicity of it, it just feels so at home to me. And again, the interplay is the other thing I love about it. Like that's the other thing I love so much about gospel writing is that that back and forth that goes, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like oh, 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 that, that Hockett stuff. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So it, it's it's just me being a, a fan of that kind of sound and that kind of musical gesture. It was just me wanting to to apply it to to, to this moment. So effective, man. Keep going. Keep I, going. Love it. I love it. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so what can I say here? Yeah. So this is basically yeah uh, the the line that Lynn had done. I'm sure I did. And then remember that voicing you're talking about earlier for uh, your favorite, right? We just talked about that earlier today. I'm with you, dude. <laughs> right? And uh, yeah, th these are just voicings that just felt right to me. Like, go to the next page, Nick. Same thing for the G7 chord. That's just a. And then again, uh, I just wanted to bring the counter line back. Right? <laughs> And it felt like it actually answered Angelica, right? Like they go first, uh, my name is Angelica Schuyler. And that was probably what led me to put something there. Because if you look in the vocal on measure 60, there's nothing happening in the vocal. So I, uh, again, the ADD in me wants to fill the space with something. So the first obvious choice for me was the counter line that Lynn had. But it's so good, you know, as a composer too, it's like, it's, it's the moments when I'm constructing the thing, that's what I'm trying to do is build these, these deep conversations that are happening. Yes, and exactly. It, yeah, it's so. It did. Do you remember when you presented it to Lynn? Did he was he hearing that? Was he tracking all of it? Was he? Did he was like, yep, I love that, or just yep, that that works. Yeah, you know, it depends. Uh, it, it, there'll be times when he'll hear something that he hadn't pictured, and be like, ah, oh, and he'll be like, yeah, oh, that's great, great, great. But I think by and large, Lynn takes it all in. And like I said, Lynn is not a really big micromanager about those things. So he'll just kind of take it in all at once and. Yeah, when they speak to him and, and they light him up, he'll mention it. So it's, exactly. you know, I, I know for me, like, there's no greater compliment than when you make Lynn excited about something that you came up with. Because, like, what higher praise <laughs> is, is that, right? Yeah. Like, what we were talking about when, you know, I, I could see the look on your face when Jacob Collier was giving you praise. Like, oh, I praise from him. Like, come on. It's like. Yeah, like, come on. Exactly. Come on. That's like, okay, I must have done something cool <laughs> to get that kind of feedback. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So let's see what else we talk about. So uh, yeah, yeah, let's go to the next page. Let's see what else. 
So, 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 sorry, my page isn't forwarding. Okay, great. So, um, great. Here again, it lends figure came back. Uh, so he did both, right? He gave you the right hand figure, uh, and then, and the old figure, right? Uh, 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 uh. So then, what I decided to do was just give more space to the vocals because there's so much happening lyrically. You want to hear her, so yeah. just get the piano out of the way, dude. And the drums is enough. Right. So then uh, comes a little kind of just like a cheeky moment, right? It's just for me in the lyric, Ben Freckman with the key and the kite. You see it, right? So I just saw that opportunity. I just like, okay, uh, that's a great little punchline. So let's just yeah. stop the band. Let's have this little bing. You see it, right? Just to me, like, like the lightning bolt of the hitting the key. Like yeah. it's just bing, whatever that is, that jolt of electricity that you feel in first love. Like it just felt right to just stop the band, have that little moment. And that just felt like the right beat to put it on. So... And again, those kinds of things like blends down with. I, su I suggested, can we try that? It's like, great, and, and we keep it. So um, it, it's fun to be able to, to contribute in that way. Um, let's go to the next page, Nick. So same thing happened here in bar 76, where I come up with the answer, ba, ba, da, da, right? He's playing this and flying by the seat of his pants. That might have been Lynn's suggestion that he wanted the band to break there. And that probably happens in rehearsals. That happens when he hears it on a singer. He decides, okay, let's just do a break there. Yeah. Because again, what I love about the theater process, it's ever evolving. The demo is just one version of it. And then when you hear it on singers, you make other decisions. When you hear other people around it, you make other decisions. And when you see it with the lights and the costumes, you make other decisions you can still. So it's, it always changes because it all has to serve the final product. And you learn things along the way and, and, and you have to take that as it comes. You know, you, have, you can't assume that the demo is going to be the exact, you know, but this big, you yeah, know, yeah. perfect the thing. The finished product, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Did you find, and yourself, then, quick, Alex, please. find yourself making changes even like into previews and oh, oh like absolutely uh, yeah uh, up until they say pencil sound there's a great saying that say uh musicals are never finished they're just abandoned <laughs> yeah, say this at some point you have to just stop <laughs> and then you can, you can tinker forever and we've been fortunate in that as other uh, uh productions have mounted we've still made changes even still and then you know apply those changes to other companies because we realize oh that works better that way so oh, really that's interesting. oh yeah yeah the work is never done yeah um, let's see, bar 82, that stop time there, that was a Blank and Bueller special because he wanted time essentially or movement to stop when Hamilton walks into the room, right? So if we are at bar 80, following the Broadway uh, reduction, uh, handsome boy, does not know it? Peach fuzz in a can of am. I want to take a bar with this place in it. Because Blank and Bueller just wanted there to just be like, Boom. so that was the idea. Just have the band stop, have the bass hit the downbeat and we're left with a figure. And what if that space and then like gradually make your way down, da, 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 ba, ba, ba. Yeah. just kind of work your way down back into the 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 the, the, the bass and the drums. Um, let's see, then we get to this section. So this was suggested by Lynn, right? At bar 84. Ba, da, da. So that was always there in the demo, the bass hitting all those quarter notes. So I kept that. Um, I judge this a little bit. If you look at Lynn's counter line, he has this in the left hand. It kind of moves a little bit. So I moved that a little bit because again, for me, it caused a little bit of a clash with the vocal that bumped me. And I know she is. That seventh there was pulling my ear. And her eye. It just kind of hit me in a certain way. So I, um, what I did, I kept the gesture. So if you look at the Broadway reduction, the notes are just which is more consonant with the melody. And so it's the same kind of feeling, right? And it comes in the same beat, but the notes are slightly different. And again, if Lynn had said, I prefer the original, we would have kept it, but he didn't seem to mind. So that was just a choice that I made along the way. Um, Let's go to the next page. Oh yeah, same thing. So we get the, the light switch moment, right? We look at Lynn's demo at bar uh, 90. Three fundamental truths at the exact same time. Right? Oh, um, oh, sorry, uh, Nick, we should be at, yeah, there you go, thanks buddy. So if you look at Lynn's bar 90. So again, I wanted the light switch. So if you look at the left hand of mine, yeah. The left hand goes, ba, 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 da. it just gives a little bit more sound and a little bit more activity leading into the empty space of that following downbeat. 
And then the same thing happened there. So you take the vocals and you harmonize them. And I, and I can't remember, that might have been Lynn suggesting that he wanted harmonies there. So what felt right to me was that voicing. Uh, yeah. Again, and all triads. Now, it, it could have been, but that I didn't like that that was above her melody. I liked that Angelica was the one carrying the melody and, and that these people were competing with her. They were supporting her. So that, that voicing could have been anywhere, but that's just where I wanted it to be. So that it su literally supported her. Huh. And then it became about supporting that in the left hand. Again, these are strange clashes, right? Look at bar 91 of the Broadway, right? Like you would not think to have a, that flat five, but it's just there. Uh, that same time, it just didn't feel right to go. That same time, just felt yeah. that same time. That just felt more right. And again, with triads, uh, you, you can't go wrong. So uh, that just felt like the right way to go. Yeah. So then uh, there's a blank spot in Lynn's demo because we didn't have these little dialogues, right? Where Hamilton says, where are you taking me? I'm about to change the, your life. That all happened in the workshop process. Yeah, Us interjecting, yeah. yeah, those lines interjecting the scene from Helpless, basically, from the other yeah, song, yeah, yeah. right? And uh, yeah, that was, uh, I can't remember whose suggestion it was to, to just have that version of the figure of the counter line, it was probably collaborative. It was Lynn and me at the piano being like, it should be this. Yeah, it should, it should totally be that. And there we have it. And that fast, kind of in rehearsal, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, okay, we need music for this scene. What should we play? Okay, this just felt the mo most obvious because it was high register. It was out of the way of, of the speaking voice, which is lower around the middle C area. So you want to just leave that space. You don't want to have drums. And this says enough. You don't need anything else. So that just felt simple and, and plain enough. And for you, do you, do you, I'm assuming I know the answer to this, but like if that happens, boom, in the rehearsal, and then you yeah. don't have time to write it down. So you just, it's just in, and you just remember it, and then later on you put it down, you commit it. I usually it. remember it, I'll jot it down in pencil, and then I always have a, a fabulous assistant ready to write it down and commit it to to, to music. So yeah, the, the, oh yeah, 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 there's always people out there ready to be able to notate all, all that stuff. And and the, the person I mentioned earlier, Scott Wasserman, was really instrumental during the early process of the readings to, to get all that stuff notated as it went. Oh yeah. And, um. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is, you know, for me, cues are very important in trying to bring in uh, uh, vocalists, especially in ways that you don't have to necessarily conduct them, because the counter line could have just ended on the C. Uh, we could have just been, we could have done, uh, uh, uh. number one, yeah. but then how do you know where that beat is? So I just knew I needed something to bring in the choir. So then comes number one. You just need two beats and you know exactly where the time is and then everyone is just aware. And that way that allows you to stretch. Yeah, exactly, because we could have taken our time. Da, da, da. Number one, all you need is just those two beats to alert you. So yeah. that was important to have a cue and have it be based on Lynn's. Da, da, da. Yeah. It's, yeah. All, it's all thematic. And again, that's what I love about arranging it. You have all the colors given to you by the song. It's all there and you just keep recycling, re reusing, reshaping. Yeah. yeah? Um, so this was fun. This is a, a, a section of the of Helpless that uses a different chord progression. So if you look at Lynn's demo, bar 95, I'm a girl in the world in which, right? Next page, Nick, we go to E flat. Da, 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 da. Normally it would have been E flat or B flat, right? Yeah. And then um, the transcription is a, a, a slight mistake. Actually, it should have been E flat over B flat. So all this to say the progression changes. It goes da, 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 da. It goes to E flat and then E flat over B, A flat. Where normally every other time it's been C down ascending the bass line, F, F instead of A flat. Yeah. Right? And then A flat. Or sorry, F instead of E flat over B flat. And you know what I mean? It just changes. So um, it was fun to take that figure and then write a character line above that. So if you look at the Broadway reduction, go back one page, Nick. So the figure changes just a little bit. Uh, Nick, you there, brah? <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. Okay, so bar 95 actually goes, bah. goes there. And then we're on this page, 97. Bah, 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 da, da, da. And then this counter line. Bah, da, da. Oh, okay, oh, there it goes. Okay, now we can go back. Go back to the next page, Nick. <laughs> Thanks, Nick, sorry. Exactly. Da, da, da. So again, that was a, a choice of mine to have that counter line, but, but have it be arpeggiated. So Nick, go back one page, please, to bar 95. So you can see how it's, right? Now go forward a page. 
So it's that counter line. Bah. And then that da, da, came from Lynn's original demo. If you look at Lynn's demo ah. bar 99. Bah, bah, da, da, da. So I took that shape. I sped it up a little bit, right? Bah, da, da. But it's bah, da, da, da. And that goes back to Lynn's original demo. So again, you see what he wanted. He wanted there to be movement. He wanted it to be a line in that register, more or less. So that's the stuff that I honor. So that's, okay, th this is another way to present it that, again, uh, just clicked with me and, and it made sense to me. And, and um, yeah, fortunately, he, he liked it and, and we got to keep it. Uh, bar 102, right? Light switch, right? I didn't mean one. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Right? So that we go to the next page and we're left with that negative space again. Cue for the vocals, right? Ba da da, number two, right? I also love how the, the, those two blank spaces ended up being three measures each, right? So that, exactly. because what's beautiful, like you're describing it, this all comes while you're in the process, right? You've got the, the demo and then you've got to cut these spaces out, but mm -hmm. the, the structure of them, giving three bars this time, three bars the next time, yeah. and the way that it's designed, even D, 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 which is pragmatic, also leads, it, it gives it an inevitability, yes. right? So, so the thing has solid structure. As, yes. And the best part is a lot of that stuff is pure coincidence because it took three measures to save those lines. Had there been more lines, we would have needed a fourth bar. And you'll see on the next page, it actually is four bars. Oh, it is four bars. So it gets extended a little bit. Okay. Exactly, because we needed more time to, to, to be able to save the line. So it's just, it's just a happy coincidence that this wound up taking the da da da, right? Uh, my sister. Number two. That's how long it took. Amazing. Right? Um, and then here we go, bar 106, right? Da, 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 da. Oh, this was fun. So, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Just a little variation. And why did I do that? Because something about the melody was speaking to me like that. So if you look at the melody, uh, have to put my ear to the, that is Simon, that is why she's sitting on the nine. I just wanted to harmonize with the vocal. So that just led me to change that to, to the sus. And that only happens once and never again. Nice. It's just one little color change. Um, but yeah, it's all, again, this was all built on wanting to leave space for the singer. Because as I mentioned before, if you look at Lynn's original demo, the figure is all eighth notes all the time, yeah. which is, and, and the left hand is also very busy, right? It keeps, keeps it, it's a lot of activity and a lot of motion. So for me, I just wanted the breath. Drums, drums. All of a sudden, just by getting rid of that incessant, beat it just gives yeah. more space there's just more more air in it and that's what i was looking for um bar 113 uh, next page please nick light switch everything is satisfied and this is the four bar version right just repeat na, 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 na. number three so this was the time that it did feel right to do the quarter notes and by the way quick little thing if you look at lynn's lyrics you notice how his lyrics at bar 118 says he's after me because i'm a skylar sister yeah instead of the Broadway version, which is I know I'm my sister like I know my own mind. And this is the genius of Tommy Kale. I, I'm pretty sure it's Tommy. And if it wasn't, Lynn, forgive me. But Tommy was like, this song is about uh, Angelica sacrificing herself for her sister because she saw how much her sister loves this man that she, Angelica, could have for herself but decides to, to leave the space open. So really it's her love for her that yeah. decides to put this. So it just felt more right to end on that. So that was a little swap and, and Lynn was down and, and, and there we did it. it. It's kind of those moments that you find in, that you can only find in workshops, right? Where oh, you're, of course. Yeah, you're yeah. Oh. And you go, you know what? That, that mm -hmm. moment. And yeah, yeah. how this change is so important. It does, it does. And, and, you know, sometimes you can see that in a demo. Sometimes you can read the lyrics and make those suggestions early on. But a lot of times, once you see it and hear it, those ideas come to you. It, 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 it's, it's, it's inevitable, like you said earlier. Right? Yeah, but you got to be on it. You got to get it up on its feet to see what what right is you just gotta like you gotta yeah. work out it you gotta you have to and see how it feels in the room and exactly yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah. please keep going <laughs> please please uh and okay the, uh so here at bar 118 you can see this is where i did want to play into the quarter notes that lynn had laid out in his demo right i know my sister i just felt right to just put that in the piano part as well right next page nick um i tell her that i love Right, I have the nine with the melody up in the in the right hand of the piano yeah. voicing. Yeah. 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 And again, gospel voicings here. We got uh, bar one twenty five. 
G7, but check out the choir. They're just a pure E flat triad. Right? On piano makes zero sense, but you hear that, you would never think to yourself, oh, that's a clash. You never yeah. hear like, oh, that rubs. No, it just fits. Jamie Lyon. It just works. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I love that. And then um, this was fun. So next page. Thank you, Nick. So Lynn's demo uses a uh, an arpeggiator. And if you listen to the SoundCloud, you'll just hear oh, this yeah. little sound. Yeah. Um, that felt too synthetic for the moment. And um, and that also could have just been born out of the fact that we just wanted more space in the workshop. So then I, I will say this. I know that uh, I'm pretty sure that when I first came up with this piano figure, this, this just whole notes, right? And that, all, all of that, that just felt right to me. And I was looking at it yesterday and I, I'm not sure I realized that the left, right hand was actually playing oh, in really? whole notes. I, I don't think I knew that. <laughs> uh, it just it was just where my ear was going. Uh, uh, I didn't know. <laughs> and again, it, slow down, which is so great, man. It, it, just, it, it, it you live with the piece enough that it just uh, uh, it just kind of seeps into you, and, it, and before you know it, it just comes out. It's just part of your subconscious. Yeah, exactly. And then. At least I keep his eyes in my life. So that this felt right for the moment. Um, this, uh, go to the next page, Nick. So in Lynn's demo, he only had one bar between his eyes in my life and the next to the groom section. And I remember hearing in the demo, like it would be like, uh, uh, at least I keep his eyes in my life. To the groom! And it just kind of kept, it just came slamming in. And for whatever reason, I remember early on hearing that demo and I thought to myself, Lynn, there's something about that moment, like it kind of goes from zero to 60 and I'm really wanting a way to, to, to work us into uh, the arrangement to the fullness of that. Would you be down to make that a two bar phrase instead of one? Because what I could do is I could take your figure, -da 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 -da. I could just double it and just sit in there. <laughs> So they, again, that was taking Lynn's original cell of an idea, reworking it and leaning into it, doubling down on it to create yeah. what felt to me like a way to get us back into the drop, if you will. Yeah. And again, it starts with the right hand and then the left hand makes its way downward, right? To the groom, right? And then along with that, contrary motion, right? If you look closely in the, the Broadway thing, you see this little string line, which I'll talk about in a second. Which just kind of gets us in there. To the groom! And again, that sweep of strings, I, I just, it, I knew I wanted that. I knew I wanted something that all four strings could play together. So it felt important for me to, to start it low so that the cello could rock it as well, so yeah. that we can have a really big, full sound. Um, and again, like I said earlier, like coming up with that scale, I probably played through every permutation before I landed on that, right? I knew I wanted to start on a G, so it's probably me just going. Ba -da -da -da. No, it should be ba da 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 da. No, it should be ba da ba da ba da 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 da. No, you know, it's like playing everything until I finally grab the one, and it's probably 15, 20 tries until you get to that, and then ten more beyond that to come back to try number twenty to realize no, try number twenty was really the one that I like. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But what you find is then once you've got it, then you can use it all over the place like this, right? Where it's like a, it's a brick. Like I was talking about these golden bricks. Exactly. Just as a motive that just works and then you can play with it as an arranger as a, instead of coming up with it as an original motive at the first sure. at the beginning. And it's all inspired by the framework that you're given, right? Like here's a moment, it, it's just a gesture that needed to happen and and you just get, get to go, which again, I just, I, I, I welcome that opportunity to just be able to just, just try to just do something that felt natural to me and, and it becomes part of, part of the piece. Uh, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I think the rest is all the harmonies we talked about. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Oh, this the last one I'll, I'll bring up for you because choir stuff that I know that you love. So check this out. Let's go, Nick, would you mind going uh, over two pages so that we get the measure 150? Beautiful. Okay, so uh, if you look at Lynn's vocal ensemble, like where it says ensemble demo, so Lynn always had um, the little, you know, uh, call and response happening. Uh, be, sat be satisfied, be satisfied, be satisfied, be satisfied. So that was always there, right? But if you look at Lynn's arrangement, it goes all the way to the end. It keeps going, like it will eventually go into the next uh, uh, page as well. So first thing I wanted to do was figure out how to not have that be completely repetitive. 
because I knew that I wanted the band to drop out at 152. I can't remember if that was a decision that was made together or something I suggested, because if you look at the uh, piano part for bar 152, the band, the left hand drops out. And I know, so we're just left with that tender, you'll be happy. Uh, so just le we're left with that space. Yeah. Um, and then the vocals were underneath and be satisfied. So I just had all the guys doing that, right? Splitting it up, uh, baritones and tenors. Yeah. But the women answer in two different locations. They answer based on where it felt right to me, according to Angelica's melody. Because if you notice on bar 152, they enter on beat four, but on bar 155, they enter on beat two. Yeah. Yep. And that's just because of the space that the lead vocal left behind, right? So here's bar 152, 152, one, two, three, and I know be satisfied she'll be happy as his bride be satisfied oh because they can't have they, they couldn't have done it on before because if they had done it on before they would have clashed with angelica they would have gone at the same time as her so the space was left open for them to sing it then so that's so felt good and then the last little fun thing that i'm very very proud of so the way that i wanted to end the um um the the back and forth the, the calls and responses if you look at bar at 156 so the baritones are the red staff, right? The downward stems, tenors are the upward stems, and the yep. ladies are the staff above it. So if you look at the baritones, and I know I'd be satisfied, they sit on the E flat. And the tenors, right? You know, be satisfied. So they're harmonized with that. And yep. then who goes last? The ladies, right? Be satisfied, be satisfied, be satisfied. And that I'm so proud of because I thought if the ladies had just stopped on me satisfied, we would have been left with E flat G and E flat. We wouldn't have had a triad. So I'm like, nope, the ladies are going to keep going. Be satisfied, I which is a great that. melody in and of itself. I just love yeah. the way that felt. So then by the time before you know it, you're left with a triad. That again, what, what I loved about that is if you look, every note works on both chords because the E flat and the G works on F minor, but also works on the A flat major seven. So no one has to move. Yep. Right. I would never be satisfied. He would never be satisfied. And then out. I would never be satisfied. So, oh, uh, next page, Nick. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, tonic chord at the end. I think uh, you know the satisfied. Yeah, I think Lynn's demo just kind of ended. Didn't really have a, a, a really final ending, so it just felt right to give a little breath at the end of it and and, and with the tonic chord. So ah, amazing. I gotta say that too, by the way, man. For all the tunes, they've all got these beautiful stingers. You know mm. that, that are not only to let the audience know okay that's the end of the song so so give some structure but also each one is so characteristic of the tune mm -hmm. you know what i mean which which i always find there's an art form to those stingers to really just to, to adding a button to that song oh. okay? and this one i love it's guitar right i think uh, i think it's a uh, um piano harp uh guitar strings come in on that chord as well uh, yeah well oh, actually we'll look at the full score in a moment i'll, I'll show you a piece of it but uh the, the one thing i was going to say is um yeah, it's the hardest thing in the world, I, I think, sometimes to come up with endings because by nature, you know, buttons can feel so cheesy. And, you know, there is a level of, of, of cheese that you have to give into sometimes because it's true. There are times that you want the audience to applaud. There are times that you want that satisfaction of like the song is ended because, you know, I, I, I've now done enough workshops and arrangements that I'm able to tell if a song is going to get a hand or not before an audience has even come in. Uh, yeah. And you know, sometimes people can't tell. And I'll bring it up in rehearsal. I'm like, by the way, just so you know, this isn't gonna get a hand. Do you want one? I'm like, oh yeah, we absolutely want one. Okay, great. So then we need to come up with a, an ending that's gonna signal uh, when it's time to, to let it go. But um, yeah, you, you always want to try to avoid the really typical jazz hands. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's a struggle sometimes because you have to, you know, I think of the ending of Yorktown that didn't exist without us. Oh, again, yeah, Yorktown, you love that chord. The world and the yeah. Oh, you love that. Yeah, that came out, you know, that wasn't there. That was Lynn and I coming up together with how it could end and me knowing that I wanted to have this big acapella moment and that's this chord and there should be this cool rub. I don't want to resolve on the tonic chord until the downbeat, you know, uh, you, you find uh, ideas along the way. Hopefully that will make you about excited about something in the way that you weren't before. So you yeah. wind up instead of shying away from what could be that potentially cheesy button, you're like, no, 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 I want that button now. <laughs> Again, you want it to feel inevitable. You want to feel inevitable. So, Alex, here's the thing. So, we, I just looked at the time. We've gone half an hour over. We've oh, my God. Really? I'm so sorry. You don't have to be sorry at all. It's just the, I, I swear to God, I could do this for another eight hours. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I've been looking at the comments and now so, I'm so sorry, but I was looking at the comments and people are saying, I've got to go. I'm sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm so sorry, buddy. 
no, 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 not at all. So the the beautiful thing is, um, uh, like we've got to do this again. If yes, I would. Better, yeah, I mean, let's let's really let's we can tear apart different pieces from different from from heights from Deborah Hansen from anything you want to do. Happy, um, happy to. I'm so fascinated by the by the process and um. I, I think it's levels of genius that are just there. It, it's it's almost impossible to put into words. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, true. I, I think the same of you and 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 the stuff that you're able to write. And I I know we have to go, but I I want to leave with this. Um, I, I feel that there's something about composing and something about writers that you really feel the presence of the person within their writing, and you hear Lin Manuel's writing and you hear a, a love behind it. You hear. Uh, inclusion, you hear community, you, you, there's something about his writing that, that really is, it, there's a warmth to it. And I feel that when I hear your compositions, like, and there's just something about your nature and your love of music and your, the, your, your love of beauty and, and, and whatever it is, there's just something about the way you approach your uh, life and your music. There's a, uh, you feel it in the writing and, and you see the person that you are through your music. And I just love that about you. So um, I, Coming, any compliment from you is very, very high praise. So, so thank I'm you for taking so it. So humbled by that, man. Truly. Um, okay, so let's 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 figure out a date, and we'll we'll just go. We'll continue. Like like. That's we, good. Alex Lackmore, thank you so much, brother. Just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for chatting with me. Yeah, and and uh, if I don't speak to you before, I mean, we'll we'll speak over text. But if I don't speak to you online before July third, uh, congratulations and good luck, man. It's gonna be. Thank you. Yeah, I I know we'll all be watching here the moment it goes live. So. Oh, thank you, man. Enjoy, enjoy. And happy Father's Day, dude. Thank you, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, bud. Um, <laughs> yeah, truly. Take care, my friend. Thank All you, right. too, Eric. Appreciate okay. it. Bye. See you, Stud. So, everybody, uh, sorry we went a half an hour over. I didn't, we've been going for two and two and a half hours now, I guess. Um, thank you all of you for sticking in and listening to this. We didn't even get to the questions. And I know a bunch of you have questions for Alex. Um, I mean, what a mind, right? Uh, it's, God, I just, I just can't get over how, how good he is. And, and I mean that on all the levels that I was talking about, that it's not only his ability to make music like that, but as a collaborator, that is such a special, unique person and art form. It's, um, yeah, I've been doing this a while and I just can't tell you how rare that is. And so it's, it's a, um, it's just a joy to spend the time with him and we'll, we'll get him back on and, and then we'll do, um, we'll, we'll make sure that you, you get the chance to ask a bunch of questions. Um, and hopefully we can get him to break down some more of these arrangements. I, I could watch this all day. They're master classes. They're <laughs> um, gang, thank you so much for, for joining in today. Uh, thank you to the NAM Foundation for making this happen and for, for Make Music Day uh, all over the globe. Uh, it's so important now to be making music. Um, thank you to producer Nick behind the scenes. Nick, you are the man. Just beautiful, beautiful work. Thank you to Meg Davies, who also produced this and who is one of the executive producers of Virtual Choir 6 actually virtual choirs two through six, um, just tireless, brilliant work, Meg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and gang, remember July 19th, that'll be the premiere of virtual choir six. And we'll, we'll do a big thing on that day. We'll have a little, uh, a little party. I might even wear a tuxedo. I think it's 10 30 in the morning here, tuxedo and champagne. I was like 10 30 in Los Angeles. Uh, take care everybody. And, uh, yeah. See you next time. Bye everyone.